with you for another episode of the Blue Ribbon Podcast. Tonight, I have a special guest because Larry is in the mountains with his grandkids. Uh, they're skiing in Aspen, so we're hoping he's going to live through this experience. Um, and then he'll be going straight to the truck show from that. So I had to have a podcast, or a, sorry, I had to have a co-host. So reached out to our friends at Pro Miles. They had me on their podcast a few weeks ago, and I believe that's going to be dropping today. So you'll be able to Correct. see that. And so we brought on Tony, uh, Tony Strongcheck, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself and Pro Miles and kind of how he got here, and then we'll see where the wind blows in what direction. Sounds Welcome, good. Tony. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you guys for having me here. And uh, I'm not too far from Larry, so if he gets stuck, I do have a great big truck, winches and everything, and I'm there probably 30 minutes from Aspen, so I'll okay. uh, go pick him up if you need me to. Uh, but no, nah, buddy, I, I really appreciate you guys uh, inviting us to come on, and I also appreciate you attending ours. Um, Pro Miles is a company that's been out there for almost 32 years. Um, we started doing federal authorities uh, in front of the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, writing tariffs in front of the Texas Road Commission in different states. Um, we went from that uh, to start, you know, helping every little trucker you can imagine to become his own boss. And when deregulation came, I mean, when I got involved, it was like in 89. And so things were still pretty complicated. You know, you had 10 license plates on the front of your truck. You got 15 different if the licenses on the side, you know, and then you've got a, I love them, Form D and Form D1 cab cards. The Form D cab card, they used to call them lick them and stick them because literally they would, for $10 to $20 per state, you would buy a stamp. You would get a handful of the stamps in. You take these Form D cab cards that have squares, just like you play in uh Know, Did bingo. they call that the bingo card? A bingo card. There you go. And lick that sucker. You stick it on there. But damn it, if that sticker didn't stay and fell off, that's 20 bucks. And you can't get through that state without a temporary license oh, just because God. you're missing that one sticker. It was a pain. But anyway, I hated regulatory side of it. I did. I hated dealing with the tariffs. I hated th the way things had to be written. You know, I wanted something easy, something fun. So me and a buddy of mine got together and, and had an argument one day and said, you know, this company out there has got this big book. It's a mileage table. And that's what we're having to base our miles on. And they're not even right. And so we found out that most of the carriers that file for you got common contract and broker authority, where on your common authority, you have to have a tariff on file. A contract authority means there is a contract between you and that person. But if you have a tariff, the tariff needs to reference something. How many miles is it going to be before, between this point to this point? Uh, what's the cost going to be? You know, all this needs to be put into a tariff. But the most common piece of the factor is the miles. Well, what we did is I went to them and I said, look, I want to come up with my own mileage guide. We're going to file it with the State Commerce Commission. We'll be the third legal mileage guide next to Rain McNally and PC Miler. And everybody looked at me like, man, you can't compete against Rand McNally. You know, you can't compete against PC Myler. I'm like, why not? All this is is a mapping system. And when I looked at their system, it literally was straight lines between center points. So there was no true graphical map curves to any of AOK PC Myler maps at that time. Even Rand McNally maps had pretty maps, but their matrices was 1,474 key cities is what they used to make that book. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what I did is I said, Tim, uh, met this guy and he, his mother had a permit service similar to ours. And we started talking about a, a way to put the system together. So I had a Tandy 1000 computer and went and we created a, basically a spreadsheet that said from this zip code to this zip code equals this many miles. And 1474 did not sound like a big number to me. Mm -mm. So what I ended up doing is I decided to go ahead and hire a handful of guys, bring them into a room and create a solution that allowed them to key this data in very quick and very easily. Now, the problem was we cheated a little bit at the beginning. We took every postal service lat long there was. And then what we did is we did mileages between them, straight line, just like they were doing, right? We said, well, how do we adjust these? Because what if this is going through Nevada and these points are going through Texas? A bunch of different roads. So at that point, we said, we're going to add a fudge factor to it. And everybody laughed at me. It's like, fudge factor? You're fudging this? I'm like, no, I'm just trying to get to an accurate number and figure out a better way to do it. By 93, we threw it all away. We said, you know what? We're going to take and do just like the U.S. Census Bureau has done. We started with the Defense Department's GIS data they've got. You don't know the name of the roads, but I'm sure to tell you where the roads are at. Inside all the major cities were blank, so we had to go fill those in. 
So we had to go out and get DOT maps and literally digitize off those maps. So back in 93, I had about 15 people in this back room with almost no lights that got lamps over them and use digitizing tablets. And they would literally touch an intersection on the tablet, click it on the map on the screen, go back and forth. And we digitalized the entire United States county wow. road up. And we said, that should be good enough. That's where trucks go. It's not the last mile. It's not within these cities. That's too hard. You know, we need to do what's more simple. Well, then next thing you know, uh, JJ Keller approached us and said, you know what? We would like a mileage product called Keller miles. And he says, you know, the key is, is you need Canada though. We're like, we don't know nothing about Canada. So we partnered with an amazing group. The it's called the statistics, uh, statistics, Canada, excuse me. Uh, they are the people that are uh, over the entire Canadian government when it comes to their poster code information. And so they did a deal with me, Tony, if you will license our poster code data, that's all six characters. It's like a zip plus four here in the U S mm -hmm. that we will allow you to sell this, but you can't make a lot of money off of it. So we sold it at a very little license of, of less than $20 per company per year to use it. And we got 896,000 key points in Canada. Next year, I know I have every Canadian province started using me to audit every trucker. Why? Because we had the best data. We had the only routing data that had poster codes at that time. And so one thing led to another after that. And now we're back into what? Regulatory compliance. Because these lovely states we've got, we're all trying to audit truckers using paper maps. Mm -hmm. That is not a way to do the audit. And so we went to the jurisdictions and the jurisdictions said we've used these other mileage products out there in the market. They're just not that accurate. You know, we need something as accurate as our paper maps. So the state of Oregon was the first state that we went to and they bought 500 licenses of our tool and said, we're going to do this at all the port of entries. We're checking for, you know, violations of logs on audits, everything with the solution. And one thing led to another. And we've got every U.S. state and every Canadian province, but two U.S. states. We've got Pennsylvania, and New York that are hopefully eventually going to move over their platforms, even though I do all the New York's oversized or weight permitting, things like that. We still uh, do not do the mile tax piece for New York's auditing. That's one more. And then Pennsylvania. Once we get those two, we're 100% used in North America. So what that means, everybody's coming to me. Hey, Tony, I know you didn't like fuel tax and keeping track of all this paper crap, but guess what? <clears throat> if you could help me take that mileage guide you built, and why don't you partner with my buddy Dave Ladner over here? He's got a little company called PeopleNet, and uh, they're going to start doing satellite tracking and all that like Qualcomm was doing. So yeah, but Qualcomm, when they triangulated, dude, half the time, my locations, we we're in lakes. I said, it ain't good data. He said, yeah, but this new stuff that people net's got a lot better. GPS got a lot more accurate. Well, the other magic thing they were able to do is capture the odometer reading. So every time we get a ping, every second, every minute, they capture that odometer reading. So what do we do? We went back to the jurisdictions and started building technology for them to help them audit the GPS. And because of that, it led us into oversized overweight. A lot of people don't know, but when you order a temporary permit in this country, mostly oversized overweight permits, ProMiles processes on behalf of the jurisdictions more than 54% of those uh, permits that are out there today. Mm -hmm. That means you go through, I mean, New York, Texas, Colorado, uh, Kansas, Georgia. When you call Georgia DOT and you hear this lovely lady on the other end, she's actually more than likely in Texas because uh, our office answers all the DOT calls for all their permits. So we got really back into something I really didn't want. It's all the regulatory side. But what I saw was the technology can help manage this. Mm -hmm. And so when Pro Miles came around, it was, let's do more than just bring a mileage. Let's bring something with it. So I can tell you up to 30,000 fuel and locations prices every day. So I can give you a tool, Pro Miles Fuel Finder. You can download it today. And in that fuel finder, you can connect it to my Pro Miles online system. And what it does lets you design your network. Let's say I only want to go to TAs, pilots, and uh, loves. And I got these following discounts at these locations. Then you activate each driver's cell phone. They open up that cell phone. They look where they're at, build a trip, give them truck legal route, and says, here's your network, and here's everything along your network. We also do fuel purchase optimization. So we'll sit there and know, well, this is what the state taxes this is what the federal tax is. This is what you're really going to pay for fuel. And we educate the industry. Quit looking at the retail sign. Mm -hmm. Quit thinking that. You got to get the tax. You got to be knowledgeable <clears throat> enough. Grab the tax information. Pull the tax out of it to see what the real underlying cost of fuel is. At the end of the day, you're paying your tax on fuel you burn. You're going to pay it, like it or not, either at the end of the quarter or you know at the pump. So the key is you better figure out, is it better in this state versus this state? Because take the tax rate away, it could be 70 cents difference 
mm-hmm. you could be putting 60 cents more back into that state, into something you shouldn't be putting it into. You should be keeping that. Use the money here. It's just a logical way to take the data and watch your numbers. But you need data. You need you need information. So mm-hmm. next thing, led, we had to know all these auditors and you know where the truck stops are at. And then all these truckers were going, well, heck, buddy, can you tell me more about the truck stop? So through the years, we built relationships like with Trucker Path. Trucker Path is a good part of ours, and, and we supply them with fuel price data. And that's how they know where all these truck stops are at all over the place. Uh, they've got their own data. They try to add to it and, and try to make it better and stuff. But we today, we off, we select the data, uh, send the data to them. We've got like FedEx uses our data. Uh, Penske uses all of our data. Ryder uses our data. A lot of the major fleets license our data, plus every major truck stop chain license the retail prices for me back to them. Why? Because they got tired 20 years ago and 15 years ago killing each other over not knowing what who's going to charge what down the road. Okay, let's figure this out. Let's get more accurate. So Pilot gets prices from me. So does Love. So does TA. They all do. You know, the key is, is I'm transparent. I'm mm-hmm. as accurate as we can be. And I'm doing it from card swipes. So every time somebody swipes a card at a truck stop, I can't tell you who trucker swiped that card, but I can tell you that truck stop just charged that amount at that pump at that moment. And every 30 minutes, I update this data. So those are some things that we do at ProMiles. Uh, we're, we're both public and private sector. So um, <clears throat> we like we like playing in the government space too. Why? Because I think we have a big voice. I think yeah. we've been able to educate and make things more more automated, like on permitting. Back when we started in this permit business in 2003, I guarantee you there was not one state that you could auto issue an oversized permit with. Right now, every jurisdiction we do has more than an 80 to 95 percentage of auto issue rate. That means no human has to touch the thing anymore. Less mistakes, more accurate, less accidents, less bridge hits. Yeah. I, so you said something there, and I, I wanted to hit on this, especially with all the TikTok drama that, that, and talking about being tracked and and your data. Well, mm-hmm. today I was driving my daughter home from an event that she was at, and I look at Google Maps, and I see red in front of me. And I went, oh, there's a wreck. I'm going to take a detour. Well, just like. And, and you tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I think just like you were talking about with uh, with PeopleNet, being able mm-hmm. to grab that odometer, having the access to to metadata essentially allows us to have things for free in a lot of cases because Google is getting data from every one of those phones and every one of those cars. Yep. You're getting data from all these trucks. Now we're getting data since the in, – in, uh, uh, since the inception of the mandatory ELD, now every truck's got a tracker in it. Every mm-hmm. all of our all of our stuff is being done now, and there's so much good that comes from someone being able to access not your phone number, not your naked pictures you've got stored on your phone, <laughs> but that metadata mm-hmm. makes all the stuff that we're used to in this highly technological society that we don't want to live without. Like we want to be mad at Google, say, oh, they're getting to my data. But hey, let me use that free Google Maps. Let me use that free mm-hmm. Gmail. Let me use that free. We want all these free services from these giant multinational companies and we want it for free. Well, they've got to make money somehow. So, you know, I don't, it don't bother me all that much when I, you know, and I'm sitting here talking to somebody about, uh, you know, wanting to buy a, a, a calculator and then Facebook shows me an ad for one. Okay. Yes. It's creepy. All right. Yes. <laughs> I would prefer, but I figured out on accident. It saves you time, huh? <laughs> I figured out by accident that if I use a different email address to sign up for Facebook than I do from Amazon, guess what? I break the connection. But what, mo- what do most of us do? We go create a free Gmail account, and mm-hmm. then we use that Gmail account to sign up for Facebook and Amazon and this one and that one and that one. Well, now they're all sharing almost anonymous data, but they have a single counterpoint or a single cross point. When I broke that chain by using, I, I changed my Amazon email address, and all of a sudden, all the Facebook stuff went away mm-hmm. because I broke the chain. Mm-hmm. There's there's so much 
in in security that we can do ourselves. We don't really need a hero. We don't need somebody to, you know, bring the hammer down. There's so much that you can do on your own to help with uh, with your own security. But that data um, that you've gotten access to, I mean that that's what's made a lot of this possible for you guys, right? It is. It is. If it wasn't for, and the other thing about this data is not all of these systems out there are great. I mean, I see the guy here talking about Trucker Path is okay as long as you don't use them for navigation. Trucker Path's trying now to do what we've been doing for 32 years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't just go out and pull the maps in and say, oh, these are the perfect maps. It's exactly where I need to route, how I need to do things. Because even some of those maps that are issued from the states are inaccurate on the map itself. And they're getting better and better. Most of these state jurisdictions, when we started doing this routing, they had no way to route a car, a truck, nothing. And now they want me to route a two million pound load and deal with all these bridges. So about two years ago, our uh, Ashto division was uh, opened up and started. We took over the Ashto, it's the bridge design and the bridge rating software for the DOTs. And uh, 40 some jurisdictions out there use that technology. And we've got some of the guys on staff, these engineers have been doing this solution for about 25 years. And so the technology is there, but it's getting everybody, not only from the public side, but also from the private side to see what's available there. I love the engagement of private and public sector together. Government can't do it all. They got their hands tied behind their back. They really do in a lot of ways where if you can go to an independent company similar to Pro Miles, we know what we're doing. We gather track record. This is what we've done. Trust in our abilities because I know what that trucker is going to want to do when he orders that permit. Trust me, I do. And so all of a, all of a sudden, Texas was the one that really, you know, in 2003 said, we're going to give you a chance. Come out there and do it. I mean, we took them from 550 to almost uh, 800,000 permits in just two years. But it was taking that data. Now with that data, I think in Colorado, it's really cool because they take and they build a, a map out and it shows every oversized overdimensional load that's ever been taken. Okay. So I know what bridges are wearing down faster than others because I can see what's happened. I'm mm-hmm. giving them visibility and it's just data points, just a bunch right. of dots. You know, I could care less. It's John Doe trucking with, uh, you know, Jim Smith driving the truck. What I care about is that truck is going to be billed or uh, priced at per mile. Then somebody's got to track where it started, where it went and do it honestly. And something that we don't have to sit there and have right now. We got hundreds and hundreds of auditors that goes out audit trucking companies, right? Could you imagine what's going to do when everybody has a Tesla? Everybody has an electric car. Okay, so now you have a mile tax. How many of these little auditors are going to be showing up at your house trying to audit you to make sure grandma didn't lie about her Tesla miles? So they're going to make sure the systems are tracked. You can manipulate it. You can cheat it. But you better be in the real back end to make it happen. Other than that, a lot long is a lot long. You get enough of them. You can know if they're valid or not. You can tell. I mean, when we look at them, we audit each point to each point. If this point to this point says the odometer went a half a mile, but from that point to that point, air distance is a quarter of a mile. Whoa, something happened here. That didn't match. You know, then we look at what the air distance is. Then we look at the driving distance of that type of truck, the class vehicle, and route them that way. And we say, this is what should have happened. But throughout the entire system, I guarantee you four to five percent of the data we get on trucks is crappy data. It's mm-hmm. not the right odometers. The odometers are not, out. you know, you know they haven't. They haven't calibrated things like they should as often as they should. They just kind of let things roll and run. But the more they look at this data, now you're figuring out return on investments. You're trying to figure out burn less fuel. Maybe this driver is better in this truck than this driver. Why? Analytics. Analytics are so valuable. And that's what you talked about with TikTok, with everything else. They're looking at what we're doing. I would rather them look at what I'm doing, to be honest with you. And so, you know, tell me the next time I'm going to go buy this uh, Italian restaurant. I really want to know. Remind me, because I'm not going to remember. But if you can tell me, and you just saved me from having to spend 10 minutes looking it up, heck, why not? I don't yeah. mind those kind of things. I am not trying to hide anything. I'm not going doing things bad or anything. So I don't, I don't care what people know or who I am or where I'm going. But I understand people that do. I really do. Yeah. Well, there's. I think that's that's the, the great thing about the blockchain is it gives us both. It gives us vis- mm-hmm. visibility and privacy at the same time. Because you, you know, I can say, well, sure, you can see what I allow you to see. Mm-hmm. What I don't allow you to see, have a Coke and a smile, you know? Um, when you, those bingo cards, I came into the industry in 97. 
and I want to say New Mexico was the last one that had something that they called the bingo card, but they were pretty much done by the time I got here, but I heard people talking about it. If they mm-hmm. had already come in at that point, right? 90. Yep. If there was 94. Yep. 93, um, 94. Surface Transportation Act. Um, That's 1986. Yeah. Surface and Transportation then, And then that came, that came out of, so. Yep. Um, the end, I came in right in that transis, trans, transitionary period from the early nineties into the two thousands. So like the first company I drove for didn't have a Qualcomm, you know, and I had to, I had to get on a pay phone and I had mm-hmm. to call and I had my notebook and I had to write down every single thing, every phone number, pickup number, address, everything was manual, no tracking. They had no idea where I was. I had a, a, a phone number that I would leave a voicemail for uh, check calls. And then I had a little voicemail thing that I could call and check every day if they would leave voicemails for me. And other than that, they had no idea where I was. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I could have been dead in a ditch and they they had no idea. And now we started using a Verizon reveal connect connect thing Mm -hmm. for dash cam and tracking in our trucks well, if one of my trucks has a hard braking incident, I get a ping on my device, you know, just mm-hmm. ping, hey, um, that's really, really useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used it twice in one morning, a week or so ago. One of my drivers got sideswiped in a construction zone. And then an hour later, guys, like, hey, I need you to pull up the video. You got to see this. Um, and it was, you know, it was so cool because I, I'm not trying to spy on my drivers. But buddy, when the when the other trucking company tears my guy's mirror off, mm-hmm. well, it sure was handy to have that video evidence of him going thirty because he was so he was he's such a sweet kid and he was like, well, man, I don't I don't know I might have been over the line and I'm like, dude, you were doing thirty miles an hour through a construction zone and she was doing fifty. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you were a centimeter across that line, she's done. Just mm-hmm. go ahead and send me the check for that new mm-hmm. mirror, right? But without that data, mm-hmm. I got nothing to stand on, you know? Um, so I love, I, I'm a technology guy. I mean, my God, I've got all the technology on my desk. Um, and my whole life runs on technology. I can run this entire fleet on this phone. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it, it's, it's a little less convenient than having a larger screen. But I, if this is all I had, I can do everything mm-hmm. that I have to do to run this fleet on that phone. And yep. that's incredible. It is. Um, so what do you think? Um, because I want, I want to hit this trucker path is okay as long as you don't use it for navigation. Let me put that up here. Because this, this is one of my, all my drivers know, or they should learn pretty quick, that if you want to get an ass chewing from me, let the words my GPS said come out of your mouth, okay? Because I will tear mm-hmm. you a new one. Because I grew up on maps mm-hmm. with no aids, okay? And I'm I'm not anti-technology. Where oh, we've got to go back to, uh, we've got to go back to maps. But when you use that thing as a crutch mm-hmm. and not a tool, and oh uh, well, my GPS said no, 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 no. Be, be, that GPS is not an authority. It is not an expert. Mm-mm. As far as I'm concerned, nobody has one good enough for you to blindly follow it. I don't. I don't give. It doesn't matter who it is, Ray McNeil, anybody else. It's a. It's a suggested route. Mm-hmm. Google suggests me a route, but it's it's weird because it's like they fundamentally know that they can't trust what Google tells them. But by God, well, Ray McNally said, "I'm like, when did Brandon McNally die on the cross for your sins?" I mean, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, and they only update their maps once a year, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so you have to, we, we do have to, we've got to keep the fundamentals, right? Mm-hmm. Because the most shocking thing to both Larry and I, when we f- kind of formally created this program, probably in, uh, late 2018, never in a million years did I dream that I would have to teach truck driving to experienced drivers. But they don't know how to scale. They don't know how to slide their tandems. They don't know how to read a map. 
They don't know what the legal weights are. They don't know what the regulatory situation is. They don't know. They they don't know anything. And I'm like, how in the hell did you come through a, tra- a truck driving school into a training program and then get at least one year of verified experience and not know how to do shit? Mm-hmm. Th- th- and that's an industry problem. Yes. Now, I mean, we could blame it on schneider us express blah 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 whoever's doing the training but at some point as an individual human being you would think somebody would be at the truck stop and go i wonder what that big scales over there for (laughs) it says cat scale i wonder what that's for you know Mm -hmm. but dude like it's baffling to me and it doesn't seem to be getting any better so I love all of the technological advances, but it's it's just become such a crutch for people, and they can't. They, they, you know what? What are you going to do if that GPS breaks? Mm. You know, I told a guy that you, you got to go pull out that paper map. I told a guy that I gave a guy an exact route. I want you to take this road to this road to this road, and I look on the tracker, and he's forty miles off course. And I, I I'm like, dude, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Well, here, and I I took a screenshot of Google Maps and I drew on the line where I told him to go. And I said, this is where you're supposed to be. This is where you are. Oh, well. But I'm realizing I think the fundamental problem is he can't read a map. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think I can say take Highway 15 to Highway 17. I, I don't think he can find it. And either he's too embarrassed to say that or don't care. I don't one or the other. Um, but, but the training, we have got to address training in this industry and I don't, I don't want to, and I don't think we can, I don't think it's fair to blame it on Swift or whoever Mm -mm. solely. They, they've got some responsibility in it, obviously. Um, but I don't, and I don't know what to fix. I would love to do an undercover boss and go to a truck (laughs) driving school Mm and like, I don't know how to drive. That would be fun. I might end up in jail. Hey, hey, check this out. I got a guy, Jacob Federson. He's uh, one of my developers, been with me for 20-something years, almost 30 years. He builds uh, the back end for all of our fuel tax. And uh, one day he kept taking time off and we couldn't figure out what what was what was Jacob doing. But finally he came in and said he actually had a uh, male dancer club he was going to. So we thought that was really cool. You're going to be a male dancer. Well, he at the end of it, he wasn't going there to do that. He went and got a CDL. I said, why? He says, well, I've done this fuel tax, dealt with all this for all these years. Least I need to do is get behind a truck and actually drive one. And so he's out of Minnesota and he's driven multiple times now just to get out there, get on the road. And just, he loves it. He's, I just wanted to have that, to understand that piece Mm -hmm. where so many people, they don't. I mean, you're talking people looking at maps. If I drive my car most of the time and my kids are with me and all that stuff and they were younger, nobody did anything. I drove, you know, my wife, She'd be my, my one going, hey, you just missed your exit there. You need to go back. Would you turn, go back there, and we'll argue half the time. But these navigation systems are there to assist. They're not there to say this is what you have to do. Preach. We, we put out a solution for the state of Illinois here this last year. It's got a right, route guidance software by ProMiles. And you can get an Illinois permit now, and we don't do Illinois permits, by the way. But Gino up there and had a situation. He said, Tony, we want to take our navigational information and put it in something so we can say, here's your permit. Listen to it. Let it tell you where to go. And so we created this route guidance software. And what it did, we took all of the positionings and the data for that route and literally had the system just like any other one on your phone. It talked to you. Go straight. Take a left. Get this off ramp. Go up on the next on ramp. Even the details of you and the pilots are the only allowed on the bridge at a time. You must deflate your tires by this much. All the details. But this is the beginning. No state's ever done this. Okay. We gave it away for free. We're going, we got to figure this out. We got to make sure, because guess what? The first thing you as a driver don't want is, hey, I go off route and now the system is contacting the DOT and saying, hey, uh, Johnny's out of route, so go pull him over. Okay. This is not a two-way system. All it does is load the data within the phone saying this is where you go. Now, Trucker Path, Rand McNally, uh, you got Copilot, my buddy's over there at, at Trimble. I like those guys a lot. Uh, I, believe it or not, Rand McNally's biggest default that they've had over the years, they just ain't had the money. People keep trying to run the name, but not really investing in their technology. 
So it's taken the rest of the world to really look at it. Now, everybody's wanting to try to build a navigation system for a truck. Everybody. But there's only four of us ever done it. And I guarantee you, it's never going to be perfect. You always better watch the signs in front of you. You know, I don't care if today when Texas updated a, a restriction in our system, click a button. The next system goes out, has that restriction in it. We're that fast now, but we're not that fast getting to everybody. So what are we doing? We're now allowing our permit manager we built for the truckers to log in and have it talk to the state websites and file these applications electronically. Why? Because the states don't want to give you an API to log in and do things with. They want mm-hmm. it to be, they don't want to deal with all that. <clears throat> so we, me, you, and everybody else in transportation has to think out of the box but think about all this knowledge and information that we are gaining from the analytics and what you can do with them. Now, some of the drivers are not going to like what they see. Some of the wives will not like where their husbands have went. But guess what? Reality is, this is the data. You are driving a commercial vehicle, a huge bomb down the road. We want to make sure you're doing it right. We want to make sure you are getting your rest, you know. But at the same time, I want to feel comfortable that I'm doing good. But I want to feel comfortable that everybody else understands it as well. So I think that's the most complicated is it's just every state trying to do things on their own way. But finally, I think over the last 15 years, I've watched more and more of it come together in unity, just like IFTA, IRP, the uh, AASHTO, the Association of DOTs, all this bringing together, I think is finally going to allow us to do more with this data. If we don't get in front of Capitol Hill and say, hey, don't don't put my data out there. Don't don't let them know what my truck is, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. Um, here's a question. Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make an assumption here, Wesley. You can throw another comment in to clarify. But I'm assuming this is probably an independent. Uh, I'm capturing odometer mileage by pen to paper for IFTA. What's a shortcut? Well, if you have your GPS, it's the easiest because it knows where you're at all the time. And if you've got a good GPS ELD provider, they'll tell you what the actual odometer reading is with each one of those lat longs. All it is at that point, buddy, is allowing some system, and most of these ELD providers use our back-end tool to actually do the processing. And all we're doing is taking what you, what your GPS said it was, and we put it on a map. We do the distance in between it. We route it. We audit the odometer. We make sure that all these things match up close enough or it's invalid. Then we figure out what's invalid, identify what's invalid, go back to the ELD provider and say, look, this guy's got a problem. Every time he starts his vehicle, turns his vehicle off, he's getting the same odometer reading. Well, those things have to be solved. It's just so much data, but it's cheap now. You know, before, Mm -hmm. if you've got all these trip sheets that you've got to hand key in and and manually do, which we still have a fuel tax online that you could do that manually, but the GPS data in the long run is more more accurate. And I guarantee you, your audit will go 100,000 times faster. Why? Because the auditors use the same mileage that we use to build it. So now Mm -hmm. they match. That's all they care about. Does it match? Is the guy compliant? And they want to move on. So what you want is take data, Automate this process and get rid of all the people manually doing it all. Don't worry about drivers not filling trip sheets out right. Go mm-hmm. with the real data, what happened to them. And at that point, it simplifies it. Hopefully that answered your question. So, well, it's interesting because um, when, when I first came to Landstar in 14 and when I came back, they used to, uh, before ELDs were mandated, everybody had to do handwritten mileage reports for IFTA. Mm-hmm. And then if you if you opted in to having an ELD, for $4 a month, they would use your ELD data and you didn't have to do the mileage reports anymore, right? Well, if you go back to the old, the good old days, <clears throat> I would have a yellow pad of paper mm-hmm. and I would, my trip plan would be, okay, I'm this many miles from this state line and it's that many miles across that state and that many miles across that state. And I had memorized, you know, I still know it's 359 miles across Arizona on I-40. It's 373 mm-hmm. miles across New Mexico on I-40. So I had that memorized. And so when I would do my trip plan from Tennessee to California, I would write, 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 write. That, the, each mileage in each state. Mm-hmm. Now, I wasn't, I had no idea what IFTA was. So when I was doing these mileage reports, I would drive across Virginia, 81. And I know it was 323 miles or something, right? So a lot of times I would just do it by memory because I knew how many miles it was. And and so we had a truck and, and I, what I'm getting, I'm, I'm taking the long way to get to something relevant to this question about redundancy, because mm-hmm. um, I was coming on I-40 to I-81 and I went up through Tennessee and up through Virginia. So I got to the end of my trip and I'm writing my mileages down and I'm looking at my odometer 
And I get to Virginia and it says 275. And I'm like, oh, I've screwed up. I've written down the wrong mileage and I reran it and reran it and I reran it. And I kept coming up wrong. And I'm like, I went back to my last fuel re- uh, fuel receipt and I knew that I fueled there and the mileage was there and nothing was adding up. Turns out we had a bad ground that was temporarily disconnecting the odometer in the dash. The ECM mileage was still ticking. Was it on PeopleNet? No, it was a nope. Qualcomm. Oh. But it was the truck. The issue was with the truck. Mm-hmm. It eventually got bad enough the way I found it. You know how the Qualcomm or any GPS device, when you start rolling it, you lose some connection to where you can't mess with it. Well, I'm driving mm-hmm. down the road 70 miles an hour, and all of a sudden my my Qualcomm screen changes as like I'm sitting still. And I look, and my odometer or my speedometer is at zero, and I'm going 70. And I'm like, what the f-? So that's how we figured out, and we kind of backed into this problem. So even writing the mileages down was not redundant enough because – I had a problem with my odometer, didn't know it, and I was losing it. Of course, Larry's raising hell about my fuel mileage at the time. Well, because the damn truck wasn't cutting all the miles that I was running, you mm-hmm. know? And so my fuel mileage looked horrible and, and all these other problems. So I think if you're using the GPS, you've got to have something redundant uh, because so many of those GPS tablets, they'll just shut off and then erase all the data, you know? <laughs> so what I want to say to this is, you don't put all your bags in one basket. Have, you know, your ELD solution is going to be pretty good, probably going to be 95% um, uh, correct, you know, because it's, it's, it, the ELD has to be connected to your odometer. Yep. But you need to be kind of aware, you know, because like he said, these audits, they know if you're jerking them around, you know, yep. and it's Tony's fault. It is. It is. You know, Tony fixed all this, right? Well, you know what I did do for him, Chris, is I finally, they didn't understand. They do very few audits today. Imagine during COVID, okay? Mm -hmm. When COVID hit, the number of audits that still were done, and they actually had more audits done in a lot of areas because they did them away from the terminal, away from the, from your office, okay? And Mm -hmm. so we were able to convince them to upload. So we built online technology so they can take from that ELD provider or from you, Give them a long list of here's my latitude, here's my longitude, my date, time stamp, my unit number, okay, and my odometer. That's all you need. I don't care what system it comes from. You just need that data. We can format it any way you want. Then they take it, they drag it on their map, let go, and the ProMiles map generates and routes every bit of it, tells them where any odometer issues are at, any additional air mile distance may be incurring. All the problems that they had to spend a month and a half auditing your 10 trucks to figure out, I showed them how to do it in an hour. Now, wait a minute. Is that good? Well, let me tell you, I I tried for many years not to really bring technology to the government that was going to slow down the industry. Okay, I felt that I could probably show them too many ways that these guys are cheating and what they're doing. And I'm not getting in the middle of that. I'm not. That's not my job. My job is to bring accuracy to the information that I'm given. And so what made us work with the truck stops, just like it's made us work with all the different you know, state jurisdictions. It's being fair, being transparent. So if you use a GPS ELD provider, okay, there's about 700 of them out there. There's only about 60 of them that I would say are really good. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's it. The rest of them are coming and going so fast. Go to the federal DOT website and guess what? They self certify themselves. Okay. That is not something that makes any sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have seen garbage data from a lot of providers and you have to go back to we audit the data we scrunch it i I care that at this point and this point's 30 meters apart and it's this many minutes apart i want to know every dot i want to hook every odometer to every one i want to pre-audit every bit of it and just give you the user here's your list of your errors now go clean them go fix your 50 or 60 things out of your thousand fleets fix it come back rerun it again your errors clean now go ahead now you know you're safe for an audit before mm-hmm. you even file your returns. And technology is what's making this happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to take a break real quick and then come back. I want to talk to you about getting an authority because it's a very hot topic with mm-hmm. us because people think that we say things about getting an authority that we don't actually say. 
And when we come back, what we're going to talk about is that process because you've been okay. doing that for a very long time. Yep. And I'll clear the air for the 721st time that we don't hate on getting an authority. It's just not something that we recommend. Uh, we've talked to y'all for the last few weeks about our friends uh, at uh, the What Was That Like podcast. Uh, Scott Johnson interviews people who have been through wildly traumatic things and lets them tell their story. And so here's a clip uh, for this week about uh, Diana surviving a plane crash. Lexington, Kentucky, 1 p.m. on a Friday, Labor Day weekend. Diana, a medical flight nurse, was sitting in a leered jet. The pilot was unconscious. The co-pilot could not move because he had a broken back. Diana's patient had died on impact. The plane was sitting on Versailles Road in Lexington after it had just slid all the way across the road on its belly. The landing gear was gone. The right wing had been ripped off the plane. And now that it had come to a stop, Diana knew she had to get the door open and get people out because she could hear the crackling of fire and the cabin was filling with smoke. Except she couldn't stand up because she had a broken back and two broken legs. Wow. That's a hell of a story. It sure is. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we want you to go check out Scott at uh, what was that like podcast? What was that like.com and uh, let him know you heard about him on the blue ribbon podcast. All right. Now let's piss everybody off about authorities. <clears throat> it is, it is our recommendation that if you are a company driver, and you have zero business experience, that the least risky move for you to make if you desire to be an owner-operator is to lease onto a carrier, not get your own authority. If you hear the sound of my voice right now, and you have your own authority, and you've had it for two years or five years, and you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing, and you're profitable, and, you're, and, and your business is thriving, congratulations. You have my absolute utmost respect because what you're doing is difficult. But I cannot in good conscience recommend that someone with zero business experience go buy a truck and a trailer and go get their own authority because your, your risk level of failing goes up exponentially uh, versus you leasing to a carrier that can help insulate you from a lot of the regulatory problems that you may have. And you can get your feet wet and build up your strength while leased to a carrier. And then if it is your heart's desire to go get your own authority and put your own name and numbers on the door, then by God, more power to you. So I put out my disclaimer, but I want to hear you talk about the reality of going from zero, uh, to having your own authority um, and the risks and or benefits, pros, cons from your perspective, because you've been doing this a long ass time. Well, Chris, the, it's I've seen a lot, a lot of folks come through and get authorities. Uh, it's funny. Uh, we had a, a surgeon, a brain surgeon came to our office, sat down with us and uh, very, very cool guy after we realized what he did for a living before. But he got tired of it. He said, I want to see the roads. He said, I want to get, I want to get out there and do things. He said, but I don't know all the rules and regs. So I need somebody to help. And so the people that we helped get authorities are some, were some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Problem is, is even though he could be a brain surgeon who really think he could drive a big truck, nobody knew, but he mm -hmm. had the money. So he bought him right. a fancy truck, you know, and had a big sleeper in the back. Him and his uh, wife was going to just travel all the time and only take so many loads a month just so they can travel. But what people don't understand is everything you have to do from the beginning to the end. It's all the unexpected things that are going to happen. Okay. You are required underneath all these rules and regs from the federal government, IRS, state governments, counties, cities. You got all these regulations over you. Your only benefit is there's so many of them. It's hard for anybody. It's impossible for anybody to understand or really understand and know every one of those rules. And by the time you think you know them, they've changed. Mm -hmm. I've had people call me from port of entry before going, Hey, 
you've got my permits, you got us legal. And this guy says, I'm not going anywhere. And we had to educate the gentleman at the port about new laws that came, came about that he didn't know about, but it took a while. Next, you know, you get the guy to leave folks at SpaceX was much happier and they went on their way. The problem with today's thing is you've got to understand there is a lot of regs, but you don't have to be a brain scientist to, to do trucking. You don't. Right. I mean, think about it. You get up, you, you turn 12 or 13 and your dad says, all right, son, come sit on my lap. You're going to drive my truck with me. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you how to use this truck back here in our big field here at a ranch. That's where we get it from. But nobody tells you what it feels like coming down from the Eisenhower tunnel with 120,000 pounds and you hit ice and you can't stop. Mm-hmm. And now you're looking not only at your life, but all the people in front of you and behind you that you're putting at risk. It's dangerous. I don't think it's, it's kind of like, I wish, you know, this, this world says you got to have a driver's license to drive a vehicle. This world says you got to have a uh, marriage license to get married, but they sure in the heck don't say you have to have a kid's license to have a damn kid, but they should. Think about it. There's a lot of kids out there would probably be much happier if their mom and dad didn't get that license. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you too, some of the kids actually changed their parents and made them better people. So I guess we do need right. to have some of that, but that regulation back 1989, you had to go to, if you hauled, toilet paper from Houston, Texas to Dallas, Texas. It was regulated. That means that only so many people in this world could haul that specific product between those points. And so you want to start a company. You want to start hauling toilet paper between Houston and Dallas. You go in, you go in front of the railroad commission in Texas. You you do a petition saying, I have somebody who's willing to pay me to haul the toilet paper. They have a need. I've got a truck. I've got a good rating with the Mm -hmm. DOT. At that point, sure, you could get an authority. Problem was, is those guys that had those authorities forever that are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars just sitting there? It's because they would go there and they said, no, petition, no, sir. We, we can still cover those loads as well. Oh, well, sorry, Mr. Strong, check all the time you put into this trying to get this done. But no, this company over here, they, they just add another truck. They can do the same thing. And so they would not allow fleets to get legal. Then you had to get federal authority. Now you want to haul from state to state. Interstate move. Well, not even got more complicated because you, are you exempt? Are you for hire? Are you private? Uh, you know, are you hauling ha- passengers? You know, what are the things you're doing? And it really isn't that complicated. It's just when you look at it from a state to state different level, you don't realize what you're going to get into. So this guy in, in uh, Beaumont, Texas, had 20 trucks, had a pretty good business, but he was going under. And the reason he was going under is because the state of Texas charged them 20 cents per gallon tax on their fuel. uh, Louisiana, which they traveled to a lot, came back to two state jurisdictions that they traveled. Their tax rate was 20 cents. But he got great fuel in Beaumont. He had his own bulk facilities and everything. So he bought in a quantity. But he had to pay Louisiana 20 cents for every gallon he burned during that quarter by the end of the quarter. Texas says, oh, yeah, you overpay tax in my state, but give me four quarters, then I'll pay you back. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. At twenty, forty to $60,000 in tax times, what, 12? Mm -hmm. That's how much you're going to have to fund just to pay your your taxes back then. Then if to came. Sure, that made things easier. Oh, you owe this state money, this state owes you money back, it comes together. But what it really didn't do is open the eyes for those guys to realize it's a little more complicated. And if you go work, for a land star, somebody that's got their stuff together. They've been through this. They've done it, you know, and they will. They'll let you work as hard as you want to work or as little as you want to work. But the key is, is you've got somebody there to help support you in that venture. Don't just jump in a truck and say, I'm going to drive a truck because I've always wanted to. You better spend a little time and look at what's coming before you end up hitting a brick wall. Yeah. Yeah, it's a um, oh, great question. God, a great question. Hmm. Is that why Bandit and Snowman were outlaws and smoking the Bandit? Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. that, there's so much, there's such an economic lesson in that movie. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of philosophical uh, mm-hmm. lessons about, about freedom and regulation. And, um, you know, listen, y'all, I mean, let, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. They were called outlaws back in the day for a reason. 
you know, they, they were not thanking the cops for their service. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they were running from them. The whole, I was telling somebody the other day, um, this guy was interviewing me on this podcast and so he knows nothing about trucking. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and he's kind of a libertarian anarchist kind of guy. And, you know, so I, I'm using the smoking the bandit, um, uh, uh, allegory. And, and I said, well, you know, we had this whole, whole other language. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, on the CB radio, mm-hmm. there was this whole other language that you would learn to speak because you were broadcasting on the, on the first social network, by the way, mm-hmm. the first place that you could say outlandish, offensive and horrible things to people. And they couldn't get their hands on you to punch you in the mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we had this whole other language that was created. Why? to get around the laws, to get around the the regulation. And that's um that's what I love about the market is because it innovate and you've 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 pretty much demonstrated this. The market always innovates faster than the state. The state mm-hmm. can never ever keep up with the market. And we're trying to you're you're literally going to them saying, guys, listen, here, let me help you. You know, and they're going, nah. We don't want it. We want to stay in the Stone Age with our <laughs> with our slide rules. And I'm like, no, but here, here's a calculate. No, we don't want to use that. Um, but yeah, Smoking the Bandit was this story about how Coors beer could not be sold east of Texas. And so you had the rich guy that wanted Coors mm-hmm. beer for his uh, little person, uh, son. And so they dared to bet this $80,000 that yeah, they could they make could it. Go they could go back. Was it wasn't 24 hours. It was, you know, something, something, buddy. It was, it was something, something, but Hey, I tell you what I love. I watched that same movie here, not even a year ago. I love it. I and mean, it's it, to me, that's, that's when I think trucking, that's the first thing I think in trucking, mm-hmm. not because there's a bunch of outlaw truckers. It's because to survive back then, to have one truck travel on your own, dude, you had to make the money and to make the money, you had to cheat on your logs. You had to have three log books. You had to learn to beat the system. You know what? Today, what are people doing today? Uber. They're beating the yeah. system, right? They're yeah. beating the system. We all hate taxis and all the money it pays for taxis and everything. But wait a minute. Now there's Uber. This whole concept is like makes so much sense. It's just we have to allow the human race to evolve. And I mean, what's going to happen in the future when when they try to really turn on all these damn autonomous vehicles? All right. All you guys, good luck. Forget forget even knowing how to drive. Just follow these positionings in this data system and, and make sure you don't go anywhere. <clears throat> My fun part is, is what are they going to do? I'm in the middle of Denver, issue all these thousands and thousands of permits, and you got this truck in the middle of Denver, and he stops, and he didn't go anywhere. There's nobody in it. So the officer finally gets up there, looks on the side, gets the name of the company, tries to call the company, going, look, I got this truck out here. I don't know what truck it is. Well, look under here, do this. That's not their job. And now the entire infrastructure is frozen because you have a truck trying to make decisions that a human needs to be there to make. Because yeah. you can never rely on the technology 100%. You can't. We can't. If we ever start doing that, it's done. In my opinion, it's done. You cannot allow a human being needs to be part of that <clears throat> conclusion. Now, I'm not saying don't automate your taxes. I'm not saying don't use this technology because trust me, I do hundreds of thousands of trucks fuel taxes with GPS. And I will tell you, we do it with a very small team staff because we know how to analyze the data, analyze the information and pre-audit it. But if it wasn't for that data, I would have to have 800 to a thousand more people to do the same thing that we're doing today, you know, with the folks that we have, you know, at 140 people that we've got everything from maintaining bridge rating systems, bridge design software to all these permitting loads. When the state jurisdiction and somebody had asked this earlier, and I do want to go back to it. How does ProMiles use analytics to say which roads those permits can go on? Well, what's really cool. It's pretty simple. Uh, If you look at it, how does Google tell you today what to do? You give them an origin, you give them a destination. They build an algorithm that says based on traffic, based on all these things, the parameters, This is the most optimal way to go, okay? What we do is we first build a route that says, here's your origin of that load, destination load. You tell us how big it is, wide it is, the link, kingpins, all this kind of cool stuff and analytics. It goes to our computer system. Our computer system says, okay, route across that and go across every structure there is. And if that structure does not qualify for this, then don't go across it. Restrict it and reroute again. And so it reroutes and reroutes and routes until it routes every possible route between those two given points. And most of the time, 
You just got to get off the off ramp and on the next on ramp. It could be that simple and you could save hundred miles. That's what we had to present to the government back in the mid 2000s. We got to think out of a box here. You got to understand that if this route's good today for this, it should still be good tomorrow. But the state said, we have no way to maintain it. What do you mean you don't have no way to maintain? Well, we don't know where our signs are at. We don't know how much asphalt we put where. So I don't know what that height is. That's why it's up to us driving vehicles to look at things, to watch, see what the sign says, to realize that, man, that just don't look like I'm going to make it. Don't go for it. <laughs> you know, don't take a left, you know, take a right. Pull do you over. need do you need people to engage more? I mean, we're you know, you're getting the, the metadata, right? Mm -hmm. But do you need people to say, hey, I saw this sign? You know, yep. like, do you need that additional input? And I guess is your system set up to take in that input? What we do is we take a lot of other data. We work with TomTom Tom a lot. Uh, back many years ago, they came to us to help them do truck routing. So if you look at TomTom Tom Logistics, it's our logistics data that's inside a TomTom Tom truck. But when you look at other systems out there, it's, it's really, it's a lot of these systems have LiDAR technology now. Okay, Google, you saw these cool cars. They drive down the road, give you a 360 view, right? Problem is, is how old is that view? Okay. The second thing is, is today LiDAR is amazing to help us with bridge structures and heights. But how many mapping companies out there know exactly how high that overpass really is? How many state jurisdictions know themselves how high it is? Some mm -hmm. of them can tell you even the middle of this much, go all the way to the right, two and a half feet. Now it's going to drop two, two and a half inches. You know, they'll give you these schematics, but very few. The government, it's just so much data. To get LIDAR data to go across this country one time to collect is terabytes and terabytes and terabytes worth of data that has to be parsed through to get this information out. As fast as we're pulling it and collecting it, it's changing just mm -hmm. as fast. So it's like it's a never ending story. Open Street has been amazing. Open Street came out many years ago. Microsoft's a big part of it. And basically, it's everybody getting together. It's going, look, why don't we all use one mapping database and we all share information of that? You know, our competitor, Copilot, PC Miler, they use they use OpenStreet as well. Most of the state jurisdiction applications that we built is on an OpenStreet platform. Why? Now, what what is OpenStreet? I've never heard of that. It is like imagine if you have Google Maps, uh, Apple Maps, any of that. Well, OpenStreet is the world getting together, saying we're all going to invest in this open source mm. information. Okay. And so everybody's now going, wait, wait a minute, if I'm driving a truck, I can maintain those roads pretty easy. But now they're trying to track cars, limousines, taxis, all these things, right? So they need better data. That's when they're starting to find out some of this data isn't that great out there that the public has used for years. But Google and them have a, an edge. Well, once a road is somewhere, that road normally doesn't move. It's just maintaining the data. But the jurisdictions needed years to start coming up with technology of their own that they can use to start managing this. Up until about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, most states didn't have their own map data. They licensed it from somebody. Mm, okay. Yep. And Microsoft Streets and Trips, Microsoft's a big part of this, uh, investing a lot in that. That's what's making their life of building those maps a lot easier for Microsoft than a Google today doing it on their own. That's, that's, that's fast. I'm looking at this now. Um, to see what it, I, I'm going to have to play with this because it's got, that's awesome. Okay. Well, they give me something to play with. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think I remember, well, I remember 2000, <sighs> my daughter was born in 06. So it must've been late 06, early 07. I got my first laptop mm -hmm. and I had, it might have been Copilot or PC Mile or there was some, or, or it could have just been some cheap. But what I would do, I was so fascinated with it because, like I said before, it was a it was a pen and a paper, mm -hmm. and now I could go in and I could I could I could look at varying routes. It would take so long to do what I do now. As in phase one of our new program, I do all of the trip planning in the first six weeks. I hand them. As here's where you're going to get fuel. These are the routes you're going to take. And so it not only takes me five minutes usually to put it together, and and I'll run the whole trip address to address. And I'm going, of course, on Google, I can drag the route anywhere I want it to go, and I'll pick it. And so here's the exact miles. But if I had to do that with a map, mm -hmm. hell, it would take 30 minutes, you know, to to write down all those individual little numbers from from point to point to point to point. 
um, and what I can do with it now in just snap of the fingers. It, I can do it in five or ten minutes. Um, but I had that, and I started playing with that. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Well, we could take this road to this road to this road, and it's only five miles difference. You know, and that was just, it opened up this whole new world to me that now we just, we just have it, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just incredible, except Apple Maps sucks. I deleted <laughs> Apple Maps from my phone. You know, I just, I don't want to <laughs> accidentally open Apple Maps, you know. Um, I was thinking about something when you were talking about Uber. There's a, a similar story kind of to the Smoking the Bandit thing. I want to say it was Portsmouth, New Hampshire or Portsmouth, somewhere up there. Um, <clears throat> somewhere in the Northeast. And a local city tried to ban Uber, or ban ride sharing, mm -hmm. in favor of the taxis. Because the taxis, here comes this new technology where just, any, just anybody could have a car and, <clears throat> and sell rides. And, of course, the taxi people were pissed off. And so the city council got together and said, yep, we've banned ride sharing. And if you do it, it's going to be this much of a fine. Well, Uber said, keep operating. If you get a fine, we'll pay it. Right. And so they kept, and then the cops would pull them over and write them a citation and Uber would pay it. And, but over a period of time, it might've been three months or six months or whatever. The government's finally going to bring down the, the big hammer. You know, mm -hmm. the fines weren't, we're, we're going to start putting people in jail. But what they had done is they had introduced the market to this amazing new service. And mm -hmm. the market went, ooh, taxis, yuck. I want an Uber. And the people said, nope, no more. And then the city council was like looking at the taxi people going, sorry. okay, well, there's like three <laughs> of y'all and there's like a million of them and they're all pissed off. So sorry, guys, you're out. That's it. It was it was an outlaw thing to do. They were They were willfully breaking the law every day mm -hmm. with the absolute blessing of this big corporation that says, we're going to pay your fines because they knew that if, if the market, the people got a taste of Uber, I remember the last time I rode in a taxi and it was a terrifying experience. You know, mm -hmm. I'll get in an Uber all day long. It doesn't, doesn't bother me a bit. Um, but sometimes we have to, it's not about breaking the law. It, it It's breaking convention. You know, mm -hmm. it's saying, look, here, listen, this thing here is so much better. And uh, yeah, I don't have your permission, whatever. Um, and I think we're going to have to start. Again, it's not about law. It's not about moral versus immoral, right versus wrong. But what we're seeing in the environment right now, um, and we've got these guys at the Capitol doing a hunger strike because they're mad at TQL. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever. But the broker is a symptom of an outdated system. When we, de when we deregulated the industry in 80, we solved a bunch of problems and created some new ones. Mm -hmm. The shipper no longer has to own trucks. The shipper could care, they couldn't care less what kind of truck it goes on. Just come and pick it up and take it where I need it to go and give me the best price. That's all I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> because none of these little individual CH Robinson has a database and TQL has a database and Landstar has a database, but none of them are connected. And so you'll have one load. One single thing that needs to be transported, and it will be posted <laughs> 400 times mm -hmm. by everybody because somebody wants to wants to broker it and somebody wants to haul it. And so, guys, there's still only one thing. There's only one, right? And there's only one truck that's going to get it. Until we decentralize a lot of these systems – and break it down to where we can get that peer, that true peer mm -hmm. to peer load to truck. Mm -hmm. Because guys, can we stop? I know, I know it's convenient to blame all your problems on the broker, but do you honestly think the shippers are that stupid? Do you really think the shippers are still paying five dollars a mile and TQL's taking four of the dollars and put it in their pocket and only giving you a dollar? 
Mm-mm. Come on now. These brokers are getting paid a commission. And the average commission by every study I've ever seen is 15%. Okay? So you guys that are screaming for broker transparency, um, you're wanting the broker to give information away that you will never give yourself. I certainly won't give it away. Tony's not going to give it away. Because if you go to Tony and put a gun to his head and say, I want to know exactly what your costs are, Tony's going to tell you to pound sand because it's none of your damn business. Mm -hmm. It's none of your damn business what his contracts are. It's none Mm -hmm. of your business what his profit is. It's none of your business what his his income, uh, his, uh, his incomes are and his expenditures. That's none of your business. But if you go to the government and you want to pull the broker's pants down, well, Law applies equally across the board. Mm -hmm. So unless you want your own pants pulled down, Mm -hmm. I suggest you mind your own business. All right. Because the, if your trucking business is failing right now, I promise you it's not the broker's fault. It's not Biden's fault. It's not the government. It's not Congress. It's not Landstar. It's not Mercer. It's not TQL. It's your fault. Okay. And the, the sooner you come to that realization that you are the only person that is going to save your business and 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 bowing your knees in front of the capital is not going to get it done because i'm going to tell you that whatever you want done to the broker when they come to do it to me i'm going to tell you no thank you i'm not doing that so anyway well chris let me so <laughs> well let me tell you chris you know i have dealt with tens of thousands of brokers in the last 32 years. They are, some of those folks are some of the sleaziest, slimiest people I've ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. Okay. However, I use the word some. Okay. So I also know there's thousands and thousands of them that I've met that I respect a lot. They help trucking companies survive. They mm-hmm. get them a load when they have to have that last load so they can get home and see the grandbabies for Christmas. Yep. The shit these guys go off and do. The goal is you got to find the right ones. You got to look at their history. You got to look at their credit ratings. You've got to, you know, get, hey, you want to haul, you want me to haul freight through you, broker? You give me some references. You tell me folks that I can call to make things better. That's what's going to help. And you just got to find the right guys. They're no different. Then, you know, somebody you go to and say, look, can you buy me better tickets there at the game? Sure. Those scalpers can go get, find the tickets, get you a good deal and get you out to you. They're making a little money off of it. What's the difference? Okay. There's What's not. the difference? You're not getting off your butt going and finding that load. You're not calling that shipper, say, Mr. Shipper, here, here's my insurance. Here's my uh, errors and missions. Here's everything else that you want from me. I'm all yours, you know, and really haul for that one shipper because the shipper don't have enough to keep that truck busy all the time. So you got to hit another guy, another guy, another guy. So it becomes, oh my gosh, I don't have time to find new business, mm-hmm. run the business has to be run. And by the time something breaks down, I got to fix it and I got to start over again. How do I do that and not starve to death? That's what happens. And what they do is they go after those brokers and says, oh yeah, come with me. I'll go ahead and pay you 20% up front right now. And it's a $2,000 uh, $2, load. Okay. And then it takes you six months to get paid. Okay. They destroy you Mm -hmm. because you didn't look first to make sure who you're working with. No different than the shipper. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of amazing shippers and Mm -hmm. there's some bad shippers. And Mm -hmm. there's some shippers out there that really honestly do not give a shit when it comes to you, your kids, how much money you make or not. They don't Mm -mm. until you start digging in their pocket. And that's when fuel surcharge index came and all these surcharges and, oh, we got to get our money back for all this. All of a sudden, these shippers started filling it back. The cares can't, they can't fix this amount. They cannot change what this fuel is costing. But you, Mr. Shipper, you got to help reimburse it. So once that started happening, everything went crazy. Because guess what? And the shippers didn't trust the carriers. Nobody trusts carriers. You carriers have been screwing us all this time. You don't pay DOE national average for fuel? Well, no. And uh, whoever thinks they should is, is crazy. You know, <laughs> every state has their own tax rate. Every route has their own fuel. And so we built a thing called fuelsurchargeindex.org. And it's simple. Origin, destination, here's your route. Here's every fuel purchase along that route you can make. And here's their average. That's what your surcharge should be based off of. Now, if you want to negotiate over, oh, I got a six mile an hour, a six MPG truck versus an eight MPG truck. Some of the shippers like that. They want you to be better off that. They want the environment better. 
But again, who pays that bill? You do, not the shipper. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you guys, if you said every broker shut down today and go away, it would kill this country. It would. We have to. What do you think Landstar is doing? They're a broker. Landstar is sitting in the middle and brokering this stuff. They're figuring out, connecting the dots. They're doing some of the back office stuff for you. But they're doing it. But guess what? Landstar is a good broker. They, they, tell you, they have to be. They got enough people underneath them, you know? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I think you got, from the beginning of this conversation, you said, before you just leap, you should walk. And that's mm -hmm. what these guys should do. Walk. Walk beside people that understand what you're about to go through. And then I'm telling you, you got to understand how living as a trucker is. Okay. It is so different. I used to travel all the time and go to truck stops, put up brochures and all that stuff. And it was so funny to walk in and see the bank of phones and up there. <laughs> and my kids and us went up to a park and they had an old pay phone. It wasn't hooked up, but we took pictures with it. Okay. They asked me, what, what is that dad? That's a, that's a phone out in the middle of nowhere like this. Yeah. And it's funny. It didn't work, but I said, yeah, this is what we used to do. They can't deal with it. No, my 11 year old niece that's uh, living with us now if it wasn't YouTube, phones, technology, everything else, I mean, I don't know what you would be doing. I mean, oh, yeah. technology is amazing. You just got to you gotta adapt with it, but don't be stupid. Don't go out there and just believe every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's going to say, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you all this money. Let me be your broker. I'll deal with it all. Because guess what? What happens when that broker ends up screwing that shipper? Well, that shipper don't care about you. Mm -hmm. So what happens? He's going to come back and stop everything from that broker getting paid. Now you're not going to get paid. Why? Because a broker did something else. So do your homework. Make sure do a do a, a BBB check. Do call go through Internet Truck Stop and DAT and all these people that have credit scores on these guys. That is the industry feeding this data back. You need analytics. You need the data to make the right decisions to the right people. And there's a there's there's some real bad ones out there, but. There's a lot of great ones, dude. Well, really listen, and and let's be honest here. Um, there's some truck drivers that <laughs> if there was a rating system, y'all would be in trouble. You know, they, they, well, they've got these <laughs> these Landstar Facebook groups, and oh my God, they're terrible. And because uh, of course everybody's if if a truck driver or a BCO at Landstar has a problem, it it if the tree falls in the woods, it's the agent's fault. These agents, ah, these agents, agents, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And this one guy was just, we need a rating system for agents. I said, no, you don't. <clears throat> because if you get a rating system for agents, guess what that comes with? A rating system for BCOs. And you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because uh, there's 1,400 agents and 11,000 BCOs. I promise you that's not going to go in your favor. So mm -hmm. think quickly. You know, <laughs> think twice about that. Um, here's something I want to hit with you. I think we talked about this when I was on your on your show. I got 9.3 mile per gallon on my last, last IFTA. Not bad. My goal is 10 mile per gallon. Now, there's this <coughs> struggle for guys at Landstar that get huge fuel mileage numbers because if they get over a point, Landstar will default them to four miles per gallon, and then their head explodes. Yep. Now, the best that we've seen with our trucks is somewhere in the sevens, you know, because, listen, the IFTA mileage is not the same as your fuel mileage on your truck. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just not, it's the number of gallons you bought, the miles that we've driven on your thing divided. And that's your fuel mileage. It's, it's not this super thing. Right. But can you give insight as to why Landstar would default us to four if we get over nine? Well, the big thing is, is in the past, if you had too high of an MPG, the auditors would just come in automatically and say, nope, I don't believe that MPG. Uh, we're going to do an audit and, uh, oh, we're going to penalize you at this. So they'll take the penalty and just move on. Okay. That's what a lot of fleets would do. The problem you've got is when you file your IFTA return, it's not filed by truck. It's filed by IFTA account. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for instance, I got a fleet of 1,000 trucks. I got 500 trucks that are getting eight miles to the gallon. I'm getting 500 trucks that are getting five miles to the gallon. You add them together, divide it up. <laughs> that's your average MPG for your fleet. But those guys get better MPGs are getting screwed. Why? Because you do the math and I'm paying IFTA based on my fleet MPG of six. Mm -hmm. So you guys at nine, I'm sorry, but I'm paying and I'm collecting back credit just at six. So that's what I'm doing to you. Now, that's up to the driver, the owner operator and the fleet that they're with to have a strong conversation. Because I believe, you know, you can run in, our, in all of our systems. You can run things based on a fleet MPG or on a per unit MPG. 
We do that on purpose. And it's up to the fleet. Who do they want to win? Them or do they want the driver to win? And to be honest with you, in a lot of cases, it washes itself out and would make better drivers with better trucks stay if you gave them that allowance of 9.3 because that's what they should be at. That's why my belief is that fuel tax, it's going to go. Okay, fuel tax will be gone before X number of years from now. They're just not getting enough out of it. They're going to charge it per mile. That's why Connecticut launched their mile tax the first of this year. More states are looking at it. Why? So they can say, I don't care what your MPG is on that truck. This is the distance you went. This is what you wore on our roads. This is what you owe. At that point, they're going to make you file this on a per vehicle basis. So now instead of having one if to return with a thousand trucks totals in one list, now you've got a thousand sheets one for every truck, breaking everything down. Analytics and this ELD day and everything else simplifies that problem where we couldn't have done it before. Would have been impossible right. to do it before. Right. But today, in my opinion, IFTA is broke. Why is IFTA broke? It doesn't make enough money to justify what it's trying to cover. And that's our expense. And so mm-hmm. mile tax is coming. And the key there is, is that 9.3, you're not spending as much on fuel as that guy with six. But that guy with six is causing you to lose money when it comes to paying your IFTA because they're not going to calculate you at your rate unless you go in and demand they do. And most of these fleets that lease on like that, they're not going to do it. Most of them said, nope, this is our rule. This is what we got. You know, here it is. You might be able to convince some of them to give you a little bit more per mile, I've seen, uh, because you have a better truck. You know, uh, they may give you some better loads uh, because you have a better truck, look nicer. And they want that, you know, expression to come across when you drove across that uh, port. Uh, But other than that, it's not they're not doing anything illegal because they are filing it based on a fleet average. Mm-hmm. That means you're calculated at a fleet average as well. It's up to you and them to fight over which is right. Okay. Well, you know, there's a guy named Steve Cron. You ever heard of him? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's got a, I think it's a 2001 International. Thing looks like a damn cross between a, a stock car and a spaceship. And his his lifetime average on that truck's over 10 miles a gallon. You know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's incredible. Uh, the whole bottom of the thing looks like a, you know, airplane. It's, it's incredible. The amount of money that he spent on that truck, to, but he gets the fuel mileage, you know, I mean, his cost of fuel is half of what ours is. Yep. Um, let's talk about big story in the, in the news this week. Uh, Knight Swift has announced that they are going to acquire us express. I think they said for $800 million, um, $6 and something a share. Um, I didn't know that U.S. Express was struggling. The Freight Waves had an article that said, you know, oh, long struggling uh, company is going to be acquired by Knight Swift. But the thing that I wanted to hit on this is in their release um, that has very specific language in it, because it has to by the SEC, it said when they complete this merger, uh, this acquisition of U.S. Express, Knight Swift U.S. Express is going to have 25,000 tractors and about 90,000 trailers. Um, and I'm already seeing the people, oh, they're going to drive their rates in the toilet. And I'm like, do y'all realize how many trucks there are on the road right now? Mm-hmm. 25,000 trucks sounds like a big deal, but in the grand scheme of the entire trucking market, it's nothing. It's a blip on the radar. It's, mm-hmm. I, I mean, who cares? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, are they with 25,000 trucks able to land some really big contracts with some really big companies like, uh, Georgia Pacific and, and, uh, and Procter and Gamble and all that? Yeah. But they're hauling freight that I don't want. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want that freight. Yep. It's going to, it's such huge volume that it's going to be cheap freight. I don't mm-hmm. want that. Let them have it. Let them run on their 80, 80 cent or 80%, what, what, what's it, ratio, operating ratio. Let them haul the shit for a dollar. I don't care. It's great for them. Mm-hmm. I want the stuff that they can't do. That's what I did for seven years at Landstar was I hauled a, a, a product that Knight Swift, Schneider, US, whoever, they could never, ever send – one of their trucks in to do that kind of freight because it had to have these hands. Mm -hmm. That's where the owner operator and the small carrier is going to make their bank. Mm -hmm. It's, it's on that amazing service level that you can give a customer that night Swift could only dream of. Okay. 
So please stop thinking that you're in the, even in the same sandbox with Knight Swift. You yeah. are not. Not even close. You got any comment on that? Well, I will say this. One thing I look at, the bigger the trucking company is, normally uh, it's it's a lot more optimized, you would hope. You would think that they could spread their cost more. They could do mm-hmm. better. Uh, and sure, they get they get good deals out there and they get good contracts. Uh, and those contracts sometimes last and sometimes they don't. But the real goal is, is to get to the end shipper and deliver what, and you, you, you said it, the hands, you know, you get a big fleet like that going into that. They don't have the quote personal touch. And that's what they need. And that's what Landstar with all these guys have done is gives you a big business behind you with professionalism, but real people that's willing to roll their shirts up, you know, get a little greasy, you know, unload some stuff when you're not even supposed to be unloading it. All the things that happen mm-hmm. with that guy going, I want to get home just like you want to get home to mama too. It's Christmas Eve. And, but I will tell you, it's not easy being those big companies. You look at all of the litigation they have going on constantly between them, drivers, shippers, carriers, everybody else that's in between. You also have management. You've got guys running some of these big organizations that's never drove a damn truck in their life. Hmm. And they're trying to tell you how you should live your life. So again, no different than the brokers and and all that. There's going to be good trucking companies. And I think right now, some of these companies are going to have to come together. They can't afford to do the things that they were trying to do over the last 10 years to try to get ahead of the game. And now they've spent all this money and effort trying to get there. Things aren't happening. Now they're eating all this. You know, they're all trying to figure out, do I go to autonomous vehicles? How do I deal with drivers? Uh, you know, all this stuff going on with Ukraine and the wars and everything else that's happening. This is so much that you've got and you're going to have, like you said, they get if they have 25,000 vehicles, then you've got probably – they're, they will probably be the largest below uh, private uh, out there. So, because right now I think the largest with well, Lance Star is what got seventeen thousand something like that. Uh, we're at eleven thousand. I think YRC is probably the biggest, Y-R-C. right? Yellow yeah, Road. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure how many folks in, in got. units. You know, but but of course LTL is a whole different. I, I did find one thing interesting in that press release that Knight Swift has their eye on LTL now. Hmm. That's that could they, get that could get spicy, yeah. you know, because I just saw the Teamsters rejected a contract today. Um, I think with YRC. Um, so I mean, if if Knight Swift with that kind of uh, infrastructure that they have, mm-hmm. uh, with all of their companies that they've bought, and of course there's a bunch of companies that U.S. Express bought. Um, well, if they wanted to go, not. Gail Roadway or ABF or one of those guys off that mm-hmm. that could get spicy real well, fast. You know, I think that's that's the way these electric vehicles and all that's got to work because you can only go a couple hundred miles. So they're going to have to literally do pick and drops constantly. And so I could see them in their mind. That's the direction because they're going, hey, we're going to be ready to move this freight 250 to 500 miles at a pop versus a thousand mile load. You know, we're yeah. going to make them smaller. They're going to need 1.7 times more vehicles than they have today uh, because you got to unplug and let the sucker plug back in. The other problem is, is do we have enough battery? Do we have enough electricity to even charge these things? There's just, there's so much for it. I mean, I love electric. I do. I, my daughter has a Tesla that she bought that she saves a lot of money every month because Tesla gives her free electric charging at home. Mm-hmm. She pays 10 bucks a month, maybe on her electric bill more, ain't much at all. And now she runs everywhere, never buys gas. We're in her Jeep Rubicon that she had from 2012. You know, she'll spend six, seven, eight hundred dollars just on fuel, mm-hmm. you know, problem is, is she's not paying her tax. She's not paying the way she's getting it free right now. Why? Cause it's the new free thing is the new way, way of it's going to happen. But these bigger fleets to make these big moves happen, it's going to take those bigger fleets to help make this monument move ever happen because today, no individual owner operators, none of those guys are going to take the risk to try to change the way transportation is done. They don't have enough power. They don't have enough energy. They don't have enough money. It, it's yeah. going to take some of these big boys to do it. And I will tell you, those companies you mentioned are all great companies. Uh, they've all, I've seen do amazing things over the last 20 or 30 years. And I'm kind of excited about the merger because I think it's bringing some really good from all of it together. Now, if they can clean it all up and clean up the whole mess and have one philosophy, one way of doing things, I think that could be one 
at a house organization. The key is they still need the drivers. They still need the owner operators. They need people to move that freight. And so the goal is, is, you know, who are you going to go with? The guy that's got an easier ride or the guy that's going to give you adventure? The guy that's going to give you a purpose. So it's yeah. all up to what you want. I would, I would just like people, I would like to see people um, look forward, you know, uh, because I, I'm not anti electric um, or anti autonomous. I don't really believe in it. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it stands to be the threat that it, that it's purported to be. And I don't think it's going to be the solution that it's purported to be. I think it's kind of overblown. Um, I also think that at some point there's already people talking about the environmental impact of building these batteries, you know, the consumption's over here. Okay. Yeah. We're saving consumption, but behind the curtain, you know, we've got to really have a talk about the environmental impact of the, of, of the, of the mining and stuff, but take the electric out of it for a minute. It, even if it's <clears throat> all combustion engine, um, I think that the big revolution that we should be looking forward to will be final mile. And I don't think final mile will be handled by commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think final mile is going to be handed by my little, my little Ram pickup truck or my little sprinter van or my, or my six wheeler. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we could see a, a big reduction in truckload capacity because I mean, hell, I, I had a guy that was on a 53-foot trailer with one pallet in it. <laughs> what the hell kind of sense does that make? But, mm -hmm. you know, um, I hauled a copier one time in a 53-foot trailer, you know, but I had blankets and straps, and they needed this copier haul, and I hauled that some bitch like 1,800 miles, a mm -hmm. copier in a 53-foot trailer. They wrote the freight bill. I hauled it, you know. But there's so many exciting things happening that I wish we would just not be distracted by the constant doomsday. Oh, autonomous are coming to take our, no, they're not. Stop. Um, will they affect some people? Yes. yes. If you're LTL right now and you're counting on that big retirement, I'd be nervous, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but there's so many cool things happening right now. We live in the safest, most prosperous time in all of human history, by every metric, you can uh -huh. you can say violent crime, war, anything. And you look at all of human history, it has never been safer. It has never been more profitable. Poverty has never been at a lower level globally. This is the best time to be alive in all of human history. But a lot of people, I'm in the Gen Xers, you know, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, they're always grumbling because they're all because we're pitted in between the boomers and the millennials that hate each other. <laughs> and then we're stuck in the middle. And I'm like, you know what? I hate you both. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, both of you shut up. Um, go back to your rooms. <laughs> yeah. Y'all like, go back to your rooms. Shut up. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm just trying to do my thing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But th this is the most fascinating time in, in all of human history to be alive. So let's not get distracted by somebody that needs us to be distracted. Let's focus on what we're doing in our daily lives, what we're doing in our business, how we can use our experience and our knowledge and our skill to make somebody else's lives better. Zig Ziglar, rest his soul, said, you can have anything you want if, you'll help enough of, if you will help enough other people get what they want. Mm -hmm. Live by that. Uh, and to me, that seems like that's what you have done at ProMiles all, uh, over all these years, is trying to make things better for other people. You know, and God help you. You're you're dealing with public and private. You talk about boomers and millennials hating each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you're stuck right in the middle. Um, you know, it's. I just think it's. Uh, I just think it's it's a good time to be alive, and I I just want to make the right decisions. And sometimes it's hard. You know. Um, hey, what do you think about the uh, BP buying TA? You think that's a big deal. Be interesting uh, because uh, TA and Loves actually owned Quick Q Fuel Card, and uh, and so and I know TA has a pretty good network out there. I just think TA was needing a change, I guess, in in my opinion. They they need a a fresh kick and a hey, let's start over. Let's do something better. 
And so I'm excited for it because all I've saw was TA just having problems through the years, TA and Petro and them coming together and, and pilot flying Jay kicking their butt, loves kicking their butt. You know, so I'm I'm kind of anxious to see what happens here. You know, BP's still, a good company. I still remember when, you know, when Flying J was a separate company and Petro mm -hmm. was a separate company and TA was a separate company. And everybody wants to talk about the good old days. And I'm like, okay, I want you all to think about this. When I when I first started in 1997 and probably for the first uh, let's see, 2000, 2001 ish is when Flying J got in that pissing contest with Calm Dad and started their own fuel card, right? Does that sound mm -hmm. about right? 2000? Yep. Yeah. They so for that, first, yep. <laughs> for that first three years, mm -hmm. you would pull up to the fuel island, you would walk inside, you would authorize your card, you would walk back outside, you would fuel your truck, you would pull forward, you would walk back inside manually sign your ticket, walk back to your truck. Getting mm -hmm. fuel was a 15 to 20 minute process. Mm -hmm. Now I can roll up to the pump, push my numbers in, dump 200 gallons in seven minutes and haul ass. And it takes longer to get fuel. Now there's probably triple the amount of truck stops mm -hmm. today than there was in 1997, you know, but we're not thinking about how much growth there has been in, I mean, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a truck stop now. And, and yep. Loves is, you know, Loves like Dollar General. They're putting them up everywhere. They sure and, are. And, and yet, it's so much more convenient and easier. Um, but yet, it takes longer because there's so many trucks. And you know, granted, people are taking a 30 minute break on the fuel aisle and taking a shower, but it's still better um, now than it was then. Uh, because what I remembered about the Flying J thing is U.S. Express, I did a, a cross-country trip in a week. It was illegal as hell. I had a logbook for going out and a logbook for coming back. But I could fuel at a U.S. US Express terminal and not have a mm -hmm. receipt. And P Flying J was the first one to do paperless receipts. So I could get fuel in Kingman, Arizona, go into California, and come back out without a fuel receipt. And I, I wouldn't keep a receipt for nothing. I bought a pack of cigarettes or a Snickers bar or whatever. I I would absolutely not ever have a receipt in my truck because I didn't want the <laughs> DOT going through my trash mm -hmm. trying to match up my logs because they were illegal as hell. Mm -hmm. Um, but now you know all of this data, everything is 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 digital. I can do everything on my phone, and, and we're so much more efficient. But yet we still have a, a lot of infrastructure problems. But I, I'll be interested to see what BP does with it. Maybe maybe they'll innovate. You know, maybe they'll. Well, you'll notice that Loves has their own fuel card, and Loves even recently just launched a ten cents off for the consumer on the gas side. So if you just drive across the country and you buy gas, go to Loves, get ten ten cents off a gallon. What was amazing is about twenty years ago, when that fuel price was so low the spread between a fuel, a truck stops cost of fuel and the actual retail they sold it for, it's called a spread. Well, it wasn't too many years ago that that spread was like eight cents. That's it. So these mm -hmm. truck stops, and that's when TA, that's when a lot of them had a lot of issues years ago because nobody can afford, everybody was getting cost plus deals. So if you've got a big fleet, you buy a lot of fuel, then you can negotiate with a truck stops. Hey, what is your cost for the fuel? Mm -hmm. I'll pay you 20 cents on top of your cost but I'm going to guarantee you I'm going to buy this much fuel from you. Okay. There's guys out there today through TA that are getting almost 40 cents off a gallon and they got one truck, mm. one truck. Now, how are they doing it? There's third parties. A guy, I know Chris Quartz, uh, he was running EFS uh, many, many years ago, uh, retired and was brought back. And now there's a company he works with TCS and it's a fuel card. And basically what they did is they went to calm dating EFS two main companies out there that do fuel cards and said, we don't really care much about how you do your customer service and your technology really isn't that great. But guess what? I want to resell it. And so TCS took co-branded Com Data card, a co-branded EFS card. But their kicker is, is they want you to put your money up. Okay. That's the problem with a lot of these cards is, you know, to get good discount stuff, they're taking the risk, you know, the truck stops. But at this point, they're pushing the risk back to you. So a lot of this is hooked up to like, uh, I think Apex is a company that owns TCS and Apex is a factoring company. Okay. So what are they doing? They're using this card through TA to get cheaper fuel 
to put money back into these truckers' pocket so they can turn around and fund and finance more of their factoring. Mm -hmm. And it's working. It's working. It's helping a huge market. But 20 years ago, you could never hear about me or you getting 20 cents off. But it got so bad that there was guys out there getting costs plus five and these truck stops were not making any money. Well, in the last 15 years, all that's changed a lot. Now, uh, there is statistics out there, analytics, and you can get with Opus or Price Information Service is the main key that was developed back in the five sister oil companies back in the 80s and 90s when the government came in and says, let's make sure we're not getting screwed. We need to monitor all this and what's happening with well, CPC. Uh, was created. And this organization is now owned by, I think, Charles Schwab. But anyway, uh, their goal is, is every day they go to every rack where fuel is pulled from, and they know what that rack selling fuel for, how much they sold it this morning for, how much they sold it this afternoon for, what was the variance throughout the day. And every day track this. About three days or four days later, they turn it into what they call an Opus cost number. So they're saying that we believe that this truck stop is buying fuel from this rack and they're paying this cost to have it freighted. And they're paying this average cost to get it. But wait a minute, average? And that's where the big hole is. It's an average. So you get a Loves that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations. Their cost is nowhere near. You got Oasis Truck Stop that has one, okay? One truck stop. His mm -hmm. cost, he's going to pay more for fuel than somebody else unless he can convince somebody he has a way to disperse more fuel there than anybody else in the area. And he gets a really good deal, which almost never happens. And so when you look at these big companies coming together, it really does help because what it's doing is helping the fleets that take a step forward and says, I want to monitor my fuel consumption, my fuel cost. I want to help work with somebody like a TA, a Loves, Pilot, Petro, any of them, you know, build a partnership with these fuel companies, talk to them, tell them what you're doing, show your networks, fill in your blank networks, and then have an easy way to show your drivers where to buy. If you do that, you can keep getting discounts. And honestly, the discounts are better today than I've ever seen them. Why? Because the spread, the truck stops are making more money per gallon, you know, today than they have in a long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen discount like with Landstar. I mean, I've seen a dollar off, you know. What's interesting is as the fuel price goes up mm -hmm. and it gets up toward the top, the discount shrinks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I can tell when it's getting ready to fall because all of a sudden our discount will go from, five cents to a dollar 20, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and it'll, and it'll be that way for a week or two, you know, it'll be this massive. And then, and then you'll see the retail prices start to drop and then they'll creep back up and our discount gets lower, you know, and then, mm -hmm. and then it drops for us and then it trickles off, you know? Um, and, and, and that's one of the things, and I'll see the, the trolls in our TikTok. Uh, I'll mention, you know, one of the benefits of being at Lane Stars, the fuel discount. Well, I got mud flap and I'm like, okay, great. That that's fine. Um, mud flap is not helping you in the ways that Lane Stars helping us. Okay. They're, they're, they're the, the insulation that you're getting from being leased to a carrier doesn't have to be Lane Star. It could be Mercer. Hell, it could be Swift. I, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter when you are leased to a carrier, you are shielding yourself from a lot of risk while your business is young and new. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like putting your baby in that car seat. Okay. Yep. Well, they don't need that car seat forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you need training wheels for a little while until you've learned all the stuff that Tony's talking about, all the regulatory stuff, your business and accounting uh, or your bookkeeping and accounting, all of that stuff. I just did my corporate tax return and God, my, he sent that to me today and it's like 40 pages of shit. I don't never understand. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and that was from my dispatch service on the side. It was a side gig. You know, imagine if I had a million dollars in revenue. It makes my head hurt thinking about it, you know. But you've got to be able to run a real business. Larry says mm -hmm. every week on this podcast, when you buy a truck, you are opening a business. No different than if you were opening a restaurant. But I promise you, if you were opening any other business than being in trucking, you would do it differently. Nobody would open a Chick-fil-A the way that truck drivers open <laughs> trucking businesses, you know, mm -hmm. that you get laughed out of every boardroom in this country. Um, I got one. So there's one final thing. and I, I don't know what I did with this image. Um, uh, oh, I might have it in my folder here, but somebody put out, it was called the uh, carrier net carrier population. And, it was a really interesting graph. Uh, oh, here it is. 
Okay, there it is. Let me figure out. Uh, everybody pay no attention to the man behind the curtain while I upload this file. Um, but what it was talking about, here it is, was, you know, from, from this, this graph from 15 to 23, so eight years. And, and throughout, um, the, the wave of, of the ups and downs of carriers coming in and carriers going out. It was this, you know, kind of up and down and up and down. And then we get to 2020 and there's massive explosion of mm -hmm. carriers comes in. I can only assume that what must go, what goes up must come down mm -hmm. in a very violent, very fast way. So, my my prediction is that it's going to crash harder and faster than say in 2009, 2014, 2017, which granted is going to be very painful for some people and I'm not I'm not celebrating that. Uh, but it's going to happen. But I think that means the recovery is faster. I think if you clear out all of this, I mean that's a massive amount of capacity that has come into this market. Mm -hmm. obviously there were loads to haul because everybody was hauling loads at ridiculous rates. I mean, five, six, seven, eight dollars a mile. Well, now we're down in normal numbers. I'm seeing two fifty, three dollars sometimes two twenty five for a long haul, but I'm still seeing three, three fifty on contracts. I'm seeing some $4 stuff. They're just not falling out of the sky like they were. So my kind of wet finger in the air is, uh, throughout the first, maybe second quarter, it crashes really hard. Rates come down a little further than they are now, but I think fuel comes down with it. Mm -hmm. But then I think we're going to have a much faster equalization. And if we can get us back our supply and demand back to equal, then our rates stabilize and, and everybody's healthy. You, you got any thoughts on that? No, just hope COVID doesn't hit again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. when you stop and look at all this mess and what's happened, that's why one of the reasons I believe that the rates did go up as well as they did. People wanted their commodity moved. They were scared. They were scared they couldn't get it moved. They wanted they wanted people that are dependent. And so, again, this is why I say to the owner operators and to the small fleets, you've got the world. Don't worry about the guys with 25, 30,000 trucks. If you've got five, 10 trucks of your own, you can manage, you operate them, you can do things, you can handle a few hits here and there. You'll survive through all this. And yeah. hey, take the advantage. Talk to your truck stops. I mean, right now your number one expense is your fuel. Talk to your truck and truck stop. And I'll tell you, I think Loves has 190 people every day that are calling out 900 touches or something. I heard just trying to get the word out there. there there's discounts. Just buy into our location. Do this. They're now creating more of uh, RV parks at the Loves too to have more parking there. Okay, uh, you've got all the parking stuff that's going on across the country right now. And what's being done. And then right here in lovely Colorado, I was wondering, I thought it was the military doing something, but they had, you know, 1500 Sprinter vans, brand new Sprinter vans down the road in front of these warehouses that have been shut for years. Well, it's guys, they're making a living now. They got 40 employees and they're converting those things into places to live. And they're selling. I mean, the place is almost empty now. They ordered a bunch more. They're waiting to come in. They are swamped. So the world's changing. Mm -hmm. Being able to work remote. I mean, I've got 150 employees. About 10 of us, you know, 11, well, not me because I work out of the house mostly, but maybe 10 people out of the whole organization that's actually in a building at any time. The rest of them are remote. We spent two years getting remote, supporting everything is remote. I wasn't going to go back. I've, I got smart. I said, why do this and just flop back again? We can be more productive. We can do better things and get more out of our people by giving them more back. The hours some of our people were saving from driving back and forth to work and everything and to be able to do it from home. The kids with COVID, there's no way our business or anybody's business would have survived if parents didn't have to step up and become become the teachers. I mean, mm -hmm. I will never homeschool ever again. Never. You know, <laughs> it was the hardest thing in life I've ever done trying to tell, you know, an eight year old. No, this is not how you do it. Well, that's how my teacher says to do it. Well, I'm sorry, you know, nine plus six at 63. I, that's how I do it, you know? And they're like, no, but you don't understand Uncle Tony. And he does all these things. And I'm like, wow, this is different. But we need people that know what they're doing to do that teaching. You know, we need people out there to do the trucking. And 
with the one thing I want to tell you about your streaming, everything I've learned about your podcast and your company and whole is you're just trying to help people. You're just trying to say, don't make the same damn mistakes I made over and over again, because those mistakes could cost the entire business. One bad load, one bad load. Boom, you're done. You're out. You know, you get an accident. You're out. You get in a motorcycle accident on the weekend. You're Mm -hmm. out. Your whole family, everything doesn't have anything now. What are you going to do? You better get your shit together and you better focus. Cause I'm telling you, if you've been doing trucking long enough, then you need to be the mentors. You need to be the ones to come in and say, Hey, I've been driving a truck, even for Landstar for eight years. Look at what I've been able to do with this. I utilize their resources. They're managing their assets and everything. I think it's amazing that you have companies like Landstar out there to help. And I, I, this big merger, I think it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes how long does it take to, to kind of all the waves to settle? Because when you bring that many organizations together, sometimes it's kind of funny. You get big organization here, and I'll give you an example, Com Data. Com Data had the number one fuel card in the country for many years. Everybody used a Com Data card, right? Well, this little bitty company came in and said, you know, Com Data, you're only doing this at truck stops. You're not doing this at gas stations. Let us use your technology. And so a little company called Fleet Corps was started. This little company came and used Comdata's technology. And next thing you know, Comdata looks back, starts realizing, oh my gosh, we're making all this money off of Fleet Corps. Wait a minute. Fleet Corps is making all kinds of money. A few years ago, Fleet Corps bought Comdata. Now, really? that was a big move. Why? Because now they're convenience stores, gas stations, truck stops, all combined into one mass piece. But that little bitty company that allowed the big company to support them for a while did a better job. And that's why I believe in Chris Quartz's TCS card. You can use Comdata or FS. He don't care. But you use his APIs. It comes through his staff, his people, because he's ran card companies for 15 years. He knows what the guys need. And he's trying to do it where the guy with one truck has the same benefit the guy has with 200 trucks. And that's where Blue Ribbon, I, I really, really am excited about what you do because there's so many people. There's hundreds of thousands of people that go into transportation every year. They don't even know where the hell to start. They don't know what to do. You know, all mm-hmm. they know is I can drive a truck because I've drove my dad's truck at the farm. But what they don't know is everything they have to go through. To me, yeah. it's people like you. It's, it's groups that will take the time and just educate the environment and, and answer their questions, you know, and, and be there for them. And, and when things get bad, cry on our shoulders. You know, it's going <laughs> to get better. It's not always going to be bad, I promise. <clears throat> well, and I, I'm not big on the brotherhood of trucking you know the 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 identity through association oh i'm a truck driver but when i started driving all i had was a box of cassette tapes and a cb radio and if i did something stupid somebody'd yell at me right and Mm -hmm. i was and i was i mean i i learned a lot about driving through etiquette um through communication with other drivers and we have lost that uh, I went out on the road. I took a, a load out for a week, probably, I don't know, a month or two ago. And I was backing into a spot at this truck stop at the end of the night, and I was wore out. And the truck had a little bit of a power steering issue, and it was just hard to turn. And I'm backing in, and this asshole just keeps blowing his air horn, you know. And I'm like, dude, I'm not anywhere near your truck. Did he get out and offer to help? No. So I get backed in. Well, then he's on my right. But there was an empty space on the other side, and then here comes a guy. And he starts to back in, and I see this guy over here. He's up on the dash, and he's getting ready to blow that horn. I got out of my truck. I walked over to my flashlight, and I, you know, hey, here, here, here. And I got him back in there, and I looked at that dipshit, and I go, (laughs) hey, that's how you do that, you know, you jackass with your stupid horn. Um, Drivers can still help each other if Mm -hmm. if y'all would would like to, you know. I did some time in platform a few years ago, and it was such a different world. Drivers talk to each other and, you know, would help secure loads and help do tarps and that kind of stuff. Van drivers, you can be on fire. They won't put you out, you know. Um, <laughs> that's just the nature of the van mm-hmm. stuff. But, um, you know, we, we have to help each other, you know. Uh, you, can't, you can't wait on the government to do it or the company to do it for you. Um, if you see somebody struggling, don't be a jackass. Just go help them. Offer them assistance. Now, maybe they don't like it, you know. Um, but well, you know, and I, I haven't had a CB radio in probably 10 years, you know, I wouldn't turn that thing on. <laughs> it was the last piece of communication on earth. Um, but, uh, 
You, uh, you hear a lot of interesting things on it now. I mean, we have to use them up here in the mountains, mostly when things go down and some of the conversation going there. It's not truckers, <laughs> ain't truckers at all. But uh, it'd be kind of cool. You know, I, I kind of miss the those days of, you know, the CB talk and the and the way the truckers did communicate. It gave them a home, a family, you know, and it, it connected them. And I, I do think that a lot of that has been lost. And that's where these chat boards, that's where podcasts and that's where these things are coming to give people the voice to be able to communicate uh, that they, you know, back then they could just use the CB radio and it would only go so far, you know, mm -hmm. at this man, you're able to present this stuff to people across the country and Canada and other, other countries. I mean, this is technology is great. And the greater it becomes, the more complex things will get. However, the faster things, like you said, will recover. Because we're getting smarter at things. You can tell, look at the human race in the last 150 years. Mm. Oh my gosh. Uh, I am so excited about 150 years from now. What's it going to really be like? How much faster we're going to go or we're just going to slam to that brick wall? I don't know yet. You know, we're going to blow the whole earth up ourselves because we don't know what we're doing. Or do we know more about what's going on with the earth than, than what uh, scientists and everybody want us to really believe? That's why they're trying to get the hell out of here. You know, <laughs> something's coming. I don't know. But what I do know is that karma is an amazing thing. You help people. And I do. I've helped so many people through the years where they couldn't even afford our software. We give it to them. You know, we go to schools here, take the software, teach them how to use these things. But no matter how much you do help, You've got to ask for help yourself and you've got to also think logical. You can't just assume it's just going to fall in your lap and all this is going to be great. It ain't, you know, Silicon Valley Bank. You heard that. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't invest with them <laughs> yeah. and I'll be having a problem right now. But if it was if it wasn't for those kind of guys, there would be no future. We would not have if it wasn't for COVID podcasts wouldn't be what it is today. Teams, you know. All these different things we get onto. I've been using GoToMeeting, GoToAssist to support my customers since the late 90s. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was the only way to do it. And then we went remote. It's like, we're already doing it. Why just mm -hmm. expand it? Technology has got better. The internet's got better. Bandwidth's got better. I've got multiple internets here on the mountain. I even got Starlink now uh, that I'm hitting. So you, you've got the ability to get there. Just allow the younger generation to come in. And, and tell you the things that you don't think is possible and do it. And that's what I did. At 19 years old, 18 years old, I went to my father-in-law, my mother-in-law at the time. And I said, look, I want to start this mileage and routing business. They laughed at me. We we're in a hot tub jacuzzi. And she looked at me and she says, I think you could do anything you want to do, darling. I said, thank you, mom. I said, and I looked at my father-in-law at the time. He, ah, you ain't going to do anything. Rand McNally, he'll kick, they'll kick your ass every day. And so on that statement, I decided to do something because it was so it couldn't be done. That's why this world changes. People, us, you, me, everybody changes this world every single day by doing something. All I can suggest, if you're a trucker, you don't know what to do, you don't know where to go, I would highly suggest talk to groups, talk to OIDA, talk to Landstar, talk to other companies that are in this, talk to drivers, go down to a truck stop. And when they're having their four hour break and they're sitting there in the lounge, Ask them, hey, what do you really like about trucking? What do you hate about trucking? What did you get into it? And guess what? By the end of the conversation, more than likely, you've made you another friend. You made somebody that has the same heart and soul that you do. Once you get that connection, you just ride in the wave, buddy. Just ride the wave. And uh, that's where a lot of people fail. They don't want to ask. You know, me, I'm a guy. I hate asking directions and I own a mapping company. Okay. But I hate asking directions. <laughs> but the key is, is it's okay to ask because you learn so much. I've learned so much over the last 53 years of my life that I would never regret doing it all over again. I just wish I could have learned a lot more. There's just so mm -hmm. much more. I, there's so much I know I don't know. But at the same time, I'm playing my small little part into getting all those loads. When COVID hit, our states that we were up live running permits never missed a day, never missed a beat. Not a one of them. Mm -hmm. Most of the other jurisdictions did. They couldn't be in the office. We had to make a change. We forced it. it. Cost me millions and millions of dollars and a lot of gray hair, a lot of headache to try to make this happen in a very quick amount of time and launch these states. You know, uh, Indiana, we just did Virginia, all these states that we did during the COVID area. Oh, my God, it was it was crazy. And we did it. And we simplified the processes, made it more, more accurate. And B, we made it more safe because that's the whole goal. All we're trying to do is, is give accuracy back to the industry, to the government, to let both sides understand what each is trying to accomplish 
connect those things together like some conduit, and then help the world and push them along. And I believe we're 20 years behind. All these conversations we're having right now, we had these conversations 20 years ago. We knew the internet was going to do things. We knew we wanted this vehicle to talk to this vehicle. We knew everything we wanted to do. It just takes time to get there. Mm -hmm. Just do it with somebody that can help. Well, since Larry's not here, I'm going to, I've got to go, I've got to hit this because there's, there's been some comments made in my TikTok, and I'm going to hit it right now. <laughs> um, you are completely wrong in leases. I make $3,000 a week after expenses. You have to be at the right company. It isn't over, I'm guessing, saturated with drivers and has a good customer freight base. Um, listen, uh, my job is to use my 25 years of experience in this business and Larry's 50 years of experience in business. And I will tell you that in 99.9% .9 of cases, the dumbest, most risky thing that you can do is lease a truck from a carrier. Maybe you're in the 0.01% and maybe you're doing a great job. But the risk level that you take on with your business by leasing a truck from a carrier and the pitfalls that are open to you is not worth it. So I want everybody that's listening to the sound of my voice, if you're thinking about getting into truck ownership, you need to do that with a paid for truck with no payments, no lease payments. I don't care who you're leased to. I don't care if you've got your own authority. I don't care what kind of contracts you've got. When you have a new business you need to have a low cost of operation, okay? We're about to be in a market crash, okay? That's been coming for years. We've been telling everybody uh, since we started doing this podcast in 2019 that this was coming and it's about to be here. So no, I'm not wrong about leases. I think leases are stupid. I think leasing, it doesn't matter if you lease it from Lone Mountain or lease it from Ryder or lease it from whoever, when you have that kind of debt load on a business, you cannot survive when things uh, get pulled out from under you. So, no, I'm not wrong about leases. Uh, we did an entire episode where Larry dissected a lease contract from one of the major carriers that we got a hold of, and it's garbage. A bunch of these carriers are using these leases to strap drivers in, people that have no business being in business, it's absolutely immoral. It's absolutely stupid. It's a level of risk that a new business doesn't need to take on. So absolutely not. Please, if you are in the sound of my voice, do not ever sign a lease contract with a carrier. Period. Period. There's an end of story because it will destroy you and they will still have the truck. And we see it every day. Go through TikTok. All the people that have talked about doing leases with companies that have bankrupted them. Mm -hmm. I did a lease. Hell, I did three of them. I did three leases with Anderson Trucking Service. Did they work out? Yes. I worked my ass off. Okay. I worked so much harder than I do now that they took that same truck, brought it to Landstar. And I worked so much harder with so much more risk than when I came to Landstar. And it doesn't have anything to do with Landstar, lease to a carrier. Um, so no, please, people, do, do not listen to this nonsense about leasing a truck is okay. It's like Dave Ramsey talking about American Express. I've got an American Express in my wallet, okay, and we use it responsibly. Uh, I understand why Dave Ramsey hates you as American Express. Um, but Dave Ramsey can't say, oh, okay, well, I know this guy's doing it. It's okay. No, 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 no. Do not ever lease a truck from a, from a carrier. Um, there's too much risk, and risk is what puts you out of business, and risk is what makes you bankrupt. Get you a paid-for truck. Get you those good contracts. Get you, like, like Tony was talking about, go out and beat the bushes and knock on doors and make the cold calls and do everything that it takes to make your business. But the focus of your business better be service of the customer. And I promise you, I can roll in with my 99 Freightliner and you can roll in with your leased Volvo or whatever and the customer don't give a shit because all they see is the inside of the trailer. They could not care less what kind of truck you're driving. And release. Well, the only thing, Chris, if you stop and think about it, if uh, you're not wanting to make money, but you just want a job and you like driving a truck, a truck, you just don't want to live with all the other mess, then heck, go lease your truck. You won't become anything. You'll survive if you survive.
If you but, survive. And, and it's, there's people that need to do that. There's people out there that, in my opinion, they're, they don't need to own their truck. They probably don't even need to be in the truck, you know? And so it's, I think it's a situational thing, but I think that everybody needs to look at their situation, their contracts, everything else. Oh, there's Mr. Larry. He's here. <laughs> well, and, and let me, let me correct one thing. Cause this somebody will see this. Uh, uh, did Larry lease a truck during the, uh, during a recession to make it work? No, he paid cash for it. He wrote an $80,000 check for his truck. Now, if he knew what he knew today, he wouldn't have bought that. He sure as hell wouldn't have bought a truck with a Mercedes. You know, um, Larry himself will tell you he did everything wrong. Everything that you mm-hmm. could do wrong. He had two trucks sitting side by side. One had a Detroit and a 13. One had a Mercedes Benz motor with a 10 speed. And he's like, well, I've never driven a 13. So I guess I'll get this one. You know, he, he got the laughing stock of the trucking industry, but. He took that Mercedes and put one make 1.8 million miles on it mm-hmm. with no in frame because of his level of attention to detail, you know? Um, but you, the, the, the learning that it takes and it, and I promise you it's the same in Tony's business. If you're not willing to learn and learn and learn and learn and push through and discover and dig and, and, and network, um, because when you're in business, you're not the focus. It's not Mm -hmm. about you. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your convenience. It's about their comfort and their convenience. You are at the bidding of your customer. Now, granted, they don't care about your problems. They only care about Mm -hmm. your service, you know, and that was the great thing. I never, I never missed a day all during the pandemic because the customer didn't care whether I was masked or whatever, you know, they didn't care. Um, as long as I showed up with the product, that's all that mattered. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not customer focused, which means if you're not others focused, if you're kind of the typical truck driver with that axis of the universe running through the top of your precious little head, you're going to struggle in business because, yeah. you know, go to a Chick-fil-A drive through and then go to a McDonald's drive through and tell me about the, you know, the, 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 the difference in the experience and who would you rather give your money to? If you are the person that's writing the check, you have a completely different outlook mm-hmm. than if you're the, the, the person receiving the check. You know, if I needed a plumber or whatever, um, and they acted in their business the way most truck drivers act in their business. No, I wouldn't, you'd never put up with that as a consumer, yeah. but for some reason in trucking, we think, you know, oh my God, everybody's going to serve me. No, honey, that's not how this works. You mm-hmm. are the servant. Don't be a slave, right? You you don't want to be a slave, but you know you have to have a servant's heart. You have to be others focused. You have to do all the things you never wanted to do mm-hmm. for less money than you wanted to do them at times you didn't want to do them because that's what the customer demands of you. And thank God that's the way it went. Because with if our pandemic would have went the complete opposite way, our country would have been destroyed. But people stood up. And I'm telling you, dude, trucking, I am so proud that this is our industry that we're in. You should be proud, every one of you guys, fighting through, getting all this done, going from truck stop to truck stop. You know, it's one thing staying in your own town, knowing what's going on. But now you're traveling around the country, you know, and now you got people getting pissed off at the truckers trying to blow them up. I mean... The nightmare the last two years that you guys have had to go through driving trucks, it takes a lot to be a trucker. And I wish a lot of the regular folks out there could be a trucker just one day, one day and live from the time you get up to the time you go to bed and have a few little hiccups, have a few things not happen, have a rock slide come up. Now you're going to be late doing everything. Everything gets falling behind, but you got to catch back up. It ain't easy. And it, it takes a really, really strong individual, I believe, not only to drive, but to be an owner-operator, even a stronger one. You yeah, know, it's very difficult to support yourself, a truck, your infrastructure, everything you got, and depending on everybody else's economics of what you're going to get paid or not, it is. It's it's very very tedious. And you know, you think about making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but man, when you're taking a chunk of that, you know, seventy thousand of it's just in fuel. You know, it's like oh shit. You know, <laughs> but then my truck, <laughs> this broke, that broke, this broke again. And oh man, I gotta get tires again. Man, every time you turn around, it's, it's, it's not little money. It's big money. And you want to have the right truck. You want to have the right, you know, transmission. You want to have the right type of equipment that's going to do you good. Same time, 
<laughs> you can't afford them all. And don't go out and buy a brand new truck. Just look nice and fancy on those roads. Get you a truck that's solid as a rock that ain't going to leave you on the side of the road, you know, and then go run your ass off. Go haul as much as you can. Get other people involved that you get involved with so that you can get similar loads together. Next, you know, you can grow this thing very big. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we've gone two hours. Um, that went by quick. I like I like talking to Tony. He always makes it interesting. Um, so you're going to be at the truck show, right? Uh, no, I personally am not. Oh, um, you're not. No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I but thought you were we do you have do. a team. Which which show? To make sure Louisville. Louisville. Yeah, we've got a team and stuff that's going to be there at Louisville. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, make this year okay. uh, because of mother in law and uh, passing and stuff like that, but. Uh, yeah, we'll have a team there. We'll have a, I think it's a 20 by 20 booth there at uh, Matt's. Okay. Um, well, we will be at the truck show. Uh, on Friday, we will be hanging out between the Landstar booth and the Landstar room. Saturday, we'll be over where uh, Pittsburgh Power is. Uh, all of our people, Pittsburgh Power, MD Alignment, Fleet Air Filter, uh, they're all right there together. So we'll be over there on Saturday. Um, we probably will not have a live podcast. We might, it just depends on Wi-Fi and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're having our drivers, uh, uh, kind of company dinner on Friday night. So if the Wi-Fi doesn't suck, I may try to put something together live, but you may just see recorded clips, uh, later. Um, so we will, uh, we'll find out. I don't know. Uh, I may, I may string something together. But it's going to be a busy weekend. But come by and see us. Um, do you know where your booth is going to be? Are you uh, no, I sh- I, we do have a booth. Our team's going. We've attended uh, Men America ever since they started. Uh, just as a place we go to, not only for our customers and drivers, but partners. You know, most all of our partners are there as well. Um, we do a big sponsorship there. Uh, we got a lot going on. So I know that uh, we've got a whole team of folks that will be there that you should be able to go to and I should be much better at this and having my booth number and everything in front of me. But uh, I guess I could text somebody, couldn't I? Yeah. But uh, anyway, let me find that out. And uh, But Chris, well, I, they, I appreciate listen, you, they, they can They can go on the website and find it. I mean, listen, if you've never been to the truck show, you better have a plan because it's a million square feet. And I don't think you could see it all in two days. Um, well, I put it know. this way. Get your wagon. Get somebody mm-hmm. to pull the wagon and as fast as you can grab everything off of all the tables as quick as you <laughs> yeah. can. That's mid America. I have never been to a trade show as big as mid America before. And I'll tell you every time we would go, it's different. I love the trucks. I love seeing the fancy trucks and everything out there, but man, I like seeing the drivers, the owner operators, the guys that are actually on the roads. Those are the guys we like to talk to there. Those are the guys that we like coming through telling us, hey, you saved me a lot of money last week because of a route. Or, hey, you helped get this permit come through for us. And we really appreciate having that interaction. I don't think you get the same anywhere but in America. It's just huge. Sometimes I think it's too huge. Yeah, it's fantastic. All righty, y'all. Well, uh, we might see you next week. If not, we'll see you the week after. And uh, come by and see us at the show if you're there. Uh, And with that... I'm going to shut her down. Everybody be cool and be safe. We'll see you next time.